Earthlings of the world unite. Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth vegan time tunnel. So we're building up an archive about the history of the vegan um, social movement. And in fact, um, this one is very foundational in that sense because we're going to talk about the origins or the birth of the vegan social movement. As you'll see in my PowerPoint, I put the wrong title. And based on that, I put out a couple of pre kind of uh, advertisements for, the, for this session. And I said, maybe we should have called it the pregnancy that led to the, to the vegan movement. Um, because that's what it is. It's not really about um, the actual movement. That's for another time. This is, this is the run up to it. But it is a really interesting um, story about how the kind of pot started to boil and we ended up with, with veganism. So that's the story today. In terms of who was pregnant, it was the Vegetarian Society, as, as we'll see, which is which is quite interesting. Um, again, uh, my producer, Colleen, is in the background, and so that means that you don't have to wait around for making comments, and um, they will appear on the screen as I'm talking, uh, because I can't do that myself, and so it will work uh, that way. So you don't need to um, wait until the end. You can put them up as soon as you've got a point or you want to ask a question. Uh, relevant to what I'm saying and then I can decide um, well it means then that I could ignore it right there and then rather than wait to the end to ignore it that's that's basically what I'm saying right okay so this is um, this is what we're doing this time and welcome again to the vegan time tunnel <laughs> Ooh, right. <clears throat> yeah, for those who are not watching on my YouTube, that's the best place to be if you want to be involved um, with the chat. That's usually where it, it all happens, as it were. So uh, that's the place to go uh, for that. And so we're going out on my Twitter and also on Facebook through the Vegan Review. Um, the Vegan Review is an interesting one because I'm um, I'm kind of an editor or something on it but not the person who founded it. But the founder can't get into it, and so we can't change it at the moment. So I think there's about 28,000 people on the Vegan Review, but it's a bit dormant. So we're trying to work out how to kind of get it revved up again, but uh, we, we haven't kind of done it uh, so far. So the birth or the origin of the vegan social movement then, um, and obviously when we get to the actual movement itself, which is going to be another time, but we're going to be talking about the birth of our movement in the sense of being born during the second world war so-called and the significance of that which is very very kind of significant in the sense that um a lot of the founders of our movement found the war experience absolutely shattering people like donald watson for example they lost some friends you know at least three of them were conscientious objectors and so therefore they had some problems uh, in that sense of um been ostracized they still worked for things like the fire brigade but they decided that they wouldn't um kill anybody uh whether they're human or not and so that's the reason why they became conscientious objectors so that's that's for an, another time so as as i said we, we're talking about the lead up really to the birth and um there's always a, a disclaimer that i have to give at this stage which is when i whenever i talk about the vegan social movement I'm not making any claims apart from the fact that these are the people who came together and formed, as far as we know, the very first organized social movement. And also they called it the vegan movement. So they gave it the name. In fact, at the end of this, this session, it, it, the, our movement will still not be named. And so that's for another time. Um, but what I'm not saying is that these are the the first people to advocate for or adopt a plant-based diet. I'm not saying that they're the first people to campaign for other animals or to make links between human rights and animal rights and anything like that. All I'm saying when I talk about our movement is that these are the people who came together to make an organized cause essentially. And so that, so that's it. And um, that's, that's what, that's what they did. And that's what I always talk about. But with that caveat that I'm not I'm not saying these are the first uh, people. Uh, arguably, they're the first vegans in the sense that they gave 
they gave us that name. So they were the first vegans. But a lot of people say, well, yeah, but what about, you know, when they go back to, you know, uh, Buddhism, you know, Pythagoreans. Well, yeah, I mean, they were possibly leading a lifestyle that we would characterize as vegan, but it wasn't vegan at the time because the, the name wasn't uh, coined at the time. So in an interview in 2004, Donald Watson said that the birth of the vegan movement had been uh, very difficult, and not least because of the relationship with the vegetarian movement. Um, Watson had an interesting take on that. I mean, first of all, he called vegetarians lactose as some, I don't, I don't know whether it was a, an insult in the know in the kind of same kind of vein as carnis but um he definitely called them the lactose um so he rejected vegetarianism in the end uh, donald watson he said that um vegetarianism is only possible due to humanity's capacity to exploit the reproduction um system or functions of other species which um and this is this is a, a characteristic of this session that sounds a quite a um, modern claim. And what you'll find all the way through this is that we're gonna go back to 1909 and then forward, right? And um, yeah, Michael, it's a good insult, yeah, the lactose, that's right. And so, um, but he, you know, we're gonna go right back there and a lot of the claims that you'll see sound really modern. And I suppose there's two ways of looking at that, it means that Things remain the same, you know, you could say, well, does that mean we haven't made much progress or just means that the fundamental arguments um, are the same. So we'll see all that. So Watson would attack vegetarianism and a lot of them did, but he said that um, we shouldn't attack vegetarians. So this is the kind of position that I've taken over the years, um, not least because vegetarians themselves are often full of remorse for their vegetarianism in the sense that you see time and time again people going you know how could i have spent so much time as a vegetarian and what they mean is so many years ignorant of of what they were doing as essentially and so you know the vegetarians are a little bit kind of shocked um about that but we'll see some of some of the um the argument as we as it develops he said there's no need for an um animosity between the two groups they ought to kind of work together and of course back in those days people might have thought that vegetarianism was a gateway um, to veganism it was, certainly was uh, an apparent connection and that feeds into the fact that uh, the vegans wanted to have a particular section within the vegetarian society and again we'll come up onto that so the time scale then initially at least is that uh, between 1909 and then 1912, there was a, a lengthy correspondence uh, about eggs and dairy, but it also it kind of got cut off by the First World War, so-called, and that was 1914 to 18, and then it started again after um, after that, and so there was a long correspondence, and it all took place here, which is the Vegetarian Messenger and Health Review. I'm just going to drop that to there. Uh, some of um, the claims, as I said, are very kind of um, modern that went on here. And there was a lot of um, vegetarians who had become uncomfortable in the seeing vegetarians consuming eggs, eggs and dairy in particular. And also the honey situation uh, developed um, as well. So um, let's go to the first kind of example, really. Again, this is from 19... 09 itself and someone said um vegetarians so-called are responsible for their share of the numbers of cows calves and fowl killed bc almost all vegetarians i know are vegetarians because they simply don't like the taste or texture of meat okay they don't care about animal rights yeah so that's um that's quite interesting but of course some people would claim that vegetarianism itself is a is a philosophy and you know followed by people like gandhi and and so forth and so there would be a lot of people who you would call ethical vegetarians but from a vegan mindset that's a difficult concept to get our heads around because it, it's inconsistent in fact watson called vegetarianism a kind of halfway house as well so um that's kind of one kind of uh, problem 
we probably wouldn't use the word foul um, anymore, but again, we're products of, the, of our time in that sense. But some of the comments that, that they did make were just about uh, birds. Here's one. It's not possible to have eggs without having on your hands a number of male birds who must be killed. So this is the kind of cockerel problem, as it was often talked about by the, the early members of the, ve uh, the vegan movement in the end. And again, veg vegetarians often have difficulty accepting this, even to this day. Certainly back then, they did. And as you'll see, there was, there was a bit of pushback. Uh, from these, this developing kind of strand within vegetarianism, um, if you like. Uh, another example would be, and this is um, said to be possibly the very first vegan cookbook. This is 1910. It's by Rupert Weldon, No Animal Food. Now, the, the kind of status of the very first vegan cookbook is, um, is uh, contested. I mean, obviously, it's it would be a, a vegan cookbook before the word vegan. Uh, so that would kind of uh, cause a problem in that sense. But Weldon said it's quite impossible to consume dairy products without slaughter, as it is to eat flesh without slaughter. And again, you get pushback from vegetarians about, about this issue because they tend to don't see vegetarianism as, as being connected to killing. In fact, a lot of them would say that the reason they're vegetarian is because they want to avoid killing um, and so this 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 thing which is kind of obvious to vegans is not obvious a lot to vegetarians so you know so you can see how the argument started to develop um, if you like um, another person here what date is this again 1910 said that um, once that cows become too old or too diseased to be milked then they became uh, the butcher's property. Which is an interesting phrase. Um, but again, uh, that part of, of the implication of vegetarianism is often hidden from vegetarians. So that was all pretty kind of um, interesting. So, of course, what we do get is some vegetarians fighting back or pushing back against what they perceived as, um, as cr critique, really. Um, they mainly uh, made what we would call welfareist claims. I, I think, for example, um, this one here. This is somebody who said they had a diploma from a Scottish dairy school. So they were a vegetarian in a Scottish dairy school. And they stated that cows can be used for milk with no need for cruelty. And anybody on TikTok or any, anywhere else on, on social media will know that um, farmers will still still maintain this. They also then went on to say, few cows fret over their removed calf, provided that they are not allowed to see or lick it. Now, there's a few red flags here, which I've, I've actually put in red. And as you can imagine, those who know me, um, this is my emphasis here. Um, <laughs> and then it goes on, or if it is placed so far away that they, uh, the mothers, cannot hear it. So um, this is this is one thing that saddens me about the modern mo movement in the sense that you still got a lot of advocates um, calling other animals it. And I know it's difficult not to sometimes. Uh, you seem to be a strand of people now who kind of almost suggest that, well, because it's grammatically correct, it's not a problem. But in terms of the political social movement, um, it is really. So we're up to uh, 1912. Another correspondent who was pushing back, uh, again, believed that uh, mother and calf do not suffer much. And again, provided that they are not allowed to see uh, one another. And so that became a vegetarian defense uh, of, of these kind of arguments. Uh, when we get up to, again, 1912. This is uh, Dougal or Dougal uh, Semple. It was a big, um, big player in the vegan movement at one point. He was one of the first fruitarians. And when I did this presentation before, I pronounced his first name Dougal, which I thought is what it was. I was told that you should you should say Dougal. So I'm going to go with uh, with my um, 
recommendation and go for Dougal uh, Semple. He stated that he did not believe that cow, uh, that milk and eggs were natural foods for human beings. Um, this is really interesting. I've, I've always found it fascinating doing the street work in Dublin, seeing all these, um, because he's going he's gonna to make a point about grown-ups, which Donald Watson did as well. But seeing, seeing these adults walking past with their calf food, their, ba their baby food, and you're just thinking, we've got a, a never wean society here. Uh, and it's really odd that, you know, these people are going to be on baby food for all of their lives and almost voluntarily so uh, as well. Um, uh, Michael, no human would want to be referred to as an it. So therefore, no non-human animals should be referred to as an it either. The pushback on there, Michael, would be that to say that we often would call human babies it if we didn't know the, the gender. The, the, re the real issue is that it's a political matter. It's not a matter of grammar. It's a, it's a matter of the fact that we're trying to alter the status of other animals. And also um, one of the major blocks to um, us getting what we want, a vegan world, and also one of the major planks of cultural speciesism is the property status of other animals. And th this reinforces that. And so the argument would be that, you know, why would we in the movement reinforce these difficult issues rather than try to challenge them? Because a lot of what we do as a social movement is to do with our claims. And so part of the battle is always linguistic. And it's been the same with, with all social movements. And of course, the classic case would be the feminist movement. I always say, you know, when, when they, they change the word history to his story to make a political point. Okay, and so you know, linguistic kind of fights, if you like, are, are, are always um, uh, there or thereabouts. And I suppose it's very prevalent at the moment with with what's going on in the trans uh, issue, um, the trans community, the trans activism, and feminism of different types. You know, uh, Deb Thompson, yeah, makes him into objects and things. Yeah, exactly. And of course. The interesting thing about that is that they are things in law. Other animals are items of property. But that's obviously what we want to change. You know, which is why Francione has got a book, Animals as Persons. So it's so weird in our legal system that a corporation can be regarded as a legal person, but other animals are just legal things. Although there's a bit of a kind of animal welfare caveat to that, which is weird, in the sense that they're characterized as sentient things which puts puts them in a kind of unique legal position in the sense that there's things that you can't do to your animal property that you could do to your DVDs and CDs if you still got them <laughs> vinyl, you know. But in, ter in terms of your, your actual inanimate property, you could do more um, with those than you can with your sentient property. But at heart, they're both types of property. So um, Semple says... Um, Eggs were meant to produce chickens and not omelettes. And cow's milk is a perfect food for a calf, but most assuredly not for a grown-up uh, human being. As I said, um, Watson made a, a very similar case. And, and we, we see this now, going back to the modern day uh, feel about this, we see this now in memes, don't we, where you, we, we've got uh, memes that try to kind of emphasize this, this issue, that you've got adult humans feasting of baby food of another species which again from a vegan point of view is um, a really interesting thing so the argument then within vegetarianism is bubbling away to get to the stage where in um, 1912 the editor of the vegetarian messenger he declares that there are two types of vegetarians and his position on this is really quite interesting and then, as you'll see, things change a little bit. Two types of vegetarians, those who consumed eggs and dairy and those who didn't. The, the honey thing is there and thereabouts, but uh, we, we'll kind of leave that to one side. Now, he said that the minority of non-egg and non-dairy vegetarians had a very strong case. So that phrase becomes very important in the history of the vegan movement. Um, he says that the arguments that he'd seen for 
eating eggs and dairy, the ones that he'd received through his journal, as it were, were, as he put it, not satisfactory. So so he'd made a, a stand, if you like, and took a, one of the harder lines um, saying that um, even though they're in the minority, the non-egg and dairy people were quite um, right in terms of their analysis. So this phrase non-dairy vegetarian um, becomes very important because uh, it transpired that the early vegans tried to get a non-dairy section of the vegetarian society. Now, another weird part of this story, or a little quirk perhaps, is the fact that eggs at this point seemingly drop out of the argument. And one reason that I've seen about that from some of the early writing is that um, post-war, eggs weren't really a, a big issue in the sense that there wasn't like an egg industry in the sense that we understand it now. And so there was a growing dairy industry, um, but the egg industry was just about to kind of kick off. And until then, people were very much kind of free range, kind of small holding type thing. Um, a couple of people, uh, a couple of ch uh, chickens scratching around in, in your garden kind of thing. That was very common, especially in kind of fairly rural kind of um, areas. Um, I mean, in, in, my, in my own life, um, my sister, who is uh, who, who went vegan in the, in the 1970s as well, but um, she remembers when she was a lass in Yorkshire and my brother. So she was eight years older than me and my brother was 10. And when people came in, because my mother had a shop, and we lived next door to my uncle's farm. And if they wanted a chicken, my brother and my sister used to have to run out the back, grab a, grab a chicken, uh, kill her, uh, pluck, pluck her, and then bring her back in within, say, five, ten minutes in, in order to sell uh, the body. So that was one of the kind of jobs that, that they did. But it, it was always this kind of small scale stuff about, about the eggs uh, in those days. So... So that, that, that kind of explains, in a way, the egg industry, uh, the egg issue disappeared for a little bit. But there's an interesting caveat coming up on that. So we, we're leaping forward. I've skipped one, I think. All right, I haven't got a slide for this. Um, in, we're leaping forward to the 1930s now. Uh, 1935, a Muriel Davis said that cattle must suffer abuse, captivity, and ultimate slaughter for humans to consume cow milk. And so these, these are still the arguments that are bubbling under. Um, no, I seem to have got out of kilter with my thing a little bit here. Okay, so I said about the egg situation. Now, this is um, John Davis. Now, he's the former manager and also the historian of the vegetarian, of the International Vegetarian Union. And he actually said that um, although everybody was talking about the non-dairy issue then, that phrase was a bit of a catch-all. So eggs didn't disappear and neither, neither did honey. It's just that it was all kind of subsumed under this one phrase, uh, non-dairy vegetarian. Um, so that's a, a bit of a kind of quirky um, kind of issue, if you like. I think I'm back on track with my slides now. Yeah. So uh, we're up to the 1930s. Muriel Davis said that cattle must suffer abuse, captivity, and ultimately slaughter for humans to consume um, cow milk. And then we get an interesting intervention now, again, from the vegetarian uh, messenger. So we're up to the um, 1940s. This is 1942 now. So very close to the start of the vegan social movement. And so obviously things are moving on and as it were, things are coming to, to a head. And so there's a bit of a change within the vegetarian journal in the sense that they were very supportive about the idea of the non-egg the non and non-dairy uh, uh, vegetarians. But then they came out with this statement, which essentially was an articulation of, of a kind of step-by-step -step approach and I think it's a pretty interesting thing to have come up just before we ended up with the, the vegan society. So they wrote in their journal that few vegetarians, however strict they may be, would claim the impossible, namely absolute consistency. Now, a little bit of conjecture um, from me here is, I don't know for sure, but I wonder whether this kind of um, feeling 
that was within the community of vegetarian stroke vegans uh, eventually led to the inclusion of practicable and possible in the official definition of veganism. Although that's much later. I mean, we talk about 1979 through to 1988 there. So it's, it's, it's a long time um, for it to have had some effect, but it's possible in the sense that, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get in that kind of same kind of feeling that, you know, perfection is um, not possible. And so therefore, you know, maybe, I mean, what's it saying? Tolerance. I mean, the, the practical and possible thing is used a lot nowadays, a lot more than I remember back in the 80s and 90s even. It's used a lot, you know, people really focus on that. And it's used to say, well, in that case, I can do this and I can do that. And so, yeah, there you go. So by the time we get to the 1930s uh, and then into the very early years of the 1940s, all the arguments that set the vegan movement on the road, the foundation of it, were in place. And they were being rehearsed over and over. And as you can see, they've been reversed, you know, for a long time, you know, quite a few decades, in, in fact. But we are getting closer and closer. Uh, this is 1943, so the year before the foundation of the vegan social movement. Leslie Cross declared that milk and its derivatives are products of pain, suffering, and abominable interference with the law of love. Um, Leslie Cross talked about love quite a lot in his essay, which is quite interesting. So it's a little bit uh, hippy trippy for a lot of people, if you like, but um, he did um, talk about it. Uh, and then um, in 1944 itself, but still before the advent of the movement, um, Semple said that if cruelty is the criteria, then dairy products are likely to cause more of it than flesh products. Now, again, this is a very kind of modern sounding um, thing. And again, it's something that the vegetarians have difficulty with. Um, I've, I've known a lot of people um, be quite shocked when this kind of argument, as it were, is appreciated and then sinks in in a sense. Because if you were to imagine, for example, a dairy heavy vegetarian, uh, they're probably causing more animal suffering. And again, if cruelty is a criteria, um, than a dairy light flesh consumer. So ironically, um, it, somebody on a carnivore diet in this modern age could be causing less animal suffering than a vegetarian uh, right now, which is really quite interesting. The only caveat I would say to that is that I know for a fact now that a lot of vegetarians, they still adhere to the label vegetarian and they that's how they self-describe but they will use you know the plant milks and um you know the vegan cheeses quite, quite often so the, the, there's usually only a couple of items uh, that would mark them as a vegetarian rather than a dietary vegan we're talking about diet here obviously so that that's a kind of you know an interesting kind of part of it i mean i mean it's like with the, the modern vegetarian societies we were talking about this most uh, vegetarian societies nowadays seem to be run by vegans, but they seem to have like an identity problem in the sense that, you know, what, you know, what, what is, what is our role now, you know, now that veganism is the moral baseline type, type issue. Um, and so it, I think it's a real kind of identity crisis um, for them, you know, really. Uh, Deb, how did people who call themselves vegetarian vegetables even consider in the wildest interpretation any animal fresh or byproduct as fitting into that category of food. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the animal flesh bit. I mean, they um, the byproduct has in um, eggs and dairy. Is that, that what you saying? I'm not quite sure what, what you're getting at there, to be honest. Um, I can't answer that because I can't understand the question. So sorry about that. You can put put that down to my inadequacy. Okay, so we're we're moving right now to the actual birth of our movement. Um, uh, Watson um, also. Uh, this is just before the beginning of the movement. He said again in this argument within the vegetarian literature 
Uh, the cow feels the loss of her calf in much the same way as a human mother would feel the loss of her child. Sometimes she will cry for days. And I told this story before that I was at an Earthlings Experience uh, event in Dublin, and there were three dairy farmers who trotted up to the to the event, th three female dairy um, farmers, and one of them was saying that the thing that really upsets her was the crying of the mother and the calf. Because I did say, well, you, you know, you could do something about that, you know, as it, as it were, <laughs> closed down. Um, she, she called it lowing. She said, I, I hate to see the cows lowing for their calves, as it were. And I asked her a subsequent question, which I was quite surprised by the answer. I thought it would be the other way around. I, I said, do you think it's worse to separate the calf straight away? Or in some cases, you know, like certain uses of other animals, um, for example, so-called beef, they might be kept with their mothers for three to five months, for example. Is it worse for them to be separated then or straight away? And she said, oh, definitely later on than very early because they're really, really bonded by then and it's really distressing uh, for them. I was expecting for some reason to, to, for the answer to be the other way around, that um, uh, it wasn't to be. Okay, so August 1944 now. Uh, Elsie Shrigley and Donald Watson. So that's uh, Elsie Shrigley is um, somebody there will be a time tunnel about, and Donald Watson um, certainly as well. Um, Elsie was sometimes called Sally Shrigley in the literature. They then go to the Vegetarian Society and they propose this non dairy section. And uh, um, Watson kind of reports on it. Uh, the, the thing you can see to the left there. The Vegan News, that's the document that um, was the first document that the Vegan Society produced, and it was written by Donald Watson. Um, he says that um, there were sympathizers within the vegetarian movement to the idea of a non-dairy section within that movement. But ultimately, it was rejected. The, the Vegetarian Society said, look, we actually want to concentrate on opposing flesh consumption and also the, another strand as well which, which was the fact that a lot of vegetarians thought that if you avoided animal products completely you would die that they, they, they actually believe that and a lot of doctors would say that and so the early vegans had to contend with the fact that a lot of their vegetarian friends a lot of the doctors that they knew and the general public obviously all said that they were going to perish because you know it wasn't possible for human beings to um, to live this way, um, which is why, incidentally, in the very early years of the vegan social movement, there was a big focus on health because they had to kind of prove that it was a feasible thing to do. So that was the big thing. And it wasn't until to the end of the 1940s when suddenly, you know, um, people like uh, Cross, Leslie Cross in particular, said, Okay, we've sorted that out. We now need to focus on vegan philosophy and you know sort that bit out, which took place in the early years of the 1950s. So the vegetarian committee said to Shrigley and Watson that they would be freer if they worked on their own and separate. So they suggested that they worked independently of the vegetarian um, society. Uh, I always claim that this was a huge favor for our movement. Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that the philosophy that eventually blossomed by the time we get to something like 1955, I'm not convinced that it would have arose if, if the vegans, as it were, would have been subsumed within the vegetarian movement. So I think it did as a great deal. In fact, they said um, that, that we would be freer to do our own thing. And one of the things that they did do was evolve what we now regard as vegan philosophy. So I think that that is true. Uh, Shrigley declared that the new vegans were idealistic. And uh, other movement historians like uh, Samantha Calvert of the Vegan Society point out that they there was a bit of an anti-establishment thrust uh, within the vegan movement founders. And Cross declared that he thought of um, vegans as pioneers. And Watson said that they have a spirit of pioneers amongst them in, in that first um, 
uh, document. And veganism didn't have um, a name at this stage. In fact, um, in this first document, uh, Watson is actually asking, what do you think? There's a bit of a vote. I don't think there's many many members at the time, but there was a bit of a vote. I mean, there was, there was interesting that people put forward ideas like dairy ban and stuff. And so luckily we ended up with vegan, I think, which was, uh, which was good. Ah, right. Um, so we're up to the actual birth of the actual uh, vegan movement. And so this is where we end our, uh, our time for today. But it is an interesting kind of gestation period um, in the sense that it was obvious that there's a lot of vegetarians, although classified as a minority, who, who started to kind of become a bit wary of any animal products whatsoever. And the people who eventually become the founders of the vegan movement were kind of um, prime movers in, in all of that, which kind of makes sense. OK, so unless we've got any points, I think we might say, saying absolute consistency impossible. Were they thinking about uh, incidental? Well, I, mm, I, I would, I always say that um, in terms of my reading, crop deaths became an issue for vegans uh, about, around about the 1950s. But I don't think I don't think it was necessarily a, a big issue for. Um, you know, for the very early founders. And I think that could be to do, I mean, people like uh, Declan Bowens from the Back of the Dale Animal Sanctuary, he always talks about the kind of evolution of farm equipment, for example. And so farm equipment back in those days, I mean, I, rem I remember kind of wanting to jump onto my uncle's tractor when he, when he was go going to, to fetch the cows to be milked down, down the way. But I mean, we're talking about, you know, little, little kind of machines, um, very little wheels and you know uh, whereas once you start to get these these big kind of mega mach machines then I think the crop death issue uh, would become more uh, prevalent and interesting I noticed that we have Benny in the um, in the audience so hi Benny and um, a few weeks ago Benny put um, kind of put out I think it was an Instagram this conversation that took place amongst um, combine harvester drivers and they were claiming that you know other animals being caught in their machinery was quite rare and and in fact it's a good job because it, it would be very destructive especially you know because some farmers and anti-vegans like to say oh you know what a, what about baby fawns uh, you know all this kind of stuff and I think um, they were saying that would be very damaging to the equipment if if they were getting caught all the time and not least to the product in the sense that it would be then be covered with blood and they have to extract all that out. It would stop everything. And so I think then uh, the crop crop death thing was always around, but it certainly wasn't um, a big deal until really kind of recently when, you know, a couple of a couple of people seem to have latched onto it as a, it's a kind of, ha ha, we've got you kind of thing, uh, which of course isn't true, but, you know, it's one of those things that, are percolating through the kind of uh, discourse about veganism uh, right now, I guess. Right, people, I shall say goodbye. I shall say thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you again. Um, Michael loves the history. Good. Well, we're, we're building up a good archive, um, which, should, which should be quite good, so it'd be nice to have it there um, so people can kind of um, get to know the history. It, it is always... Um, important for people coming into the movement to have the history at least available to them, hopefully. So there you go. Right, people, take care, and I'll see you again soon. Earth things. Welcome along to another vegan time tunnel. Not quite sure what number it is. It must be getting into the eights and nines now. Um, 
what we're going to do um, this time is kind of start a little bit of a mini series within the actual time tunnel itself in the sense that it's Women's History Month uh, this month. Uh, and so I thought this is a good time to start the, the look at the women pioneers of the movement because uh, they're often overlooked or downplayed, which is a kind of common thing within the social movements in general. So, um, hmm. so the time tunnel itself, we're building up an archive. And so uh, that's the entire idea of things. And so hopefully then we'll have in one place a whole series of videos, which we usually try to go for 30 to 40 uh, minutes. Um, there will be a couple shorter than that, which is probably a good thing. Um, and so that's the idea, just to have them all in one place to kind of create a kind of archive of, um, of the history of the movement. So welcome then to the Vegan Time Tunnel. Yes, indeed. So the women pioneers of our movement, uh, in fact. And so um, when I've done this before, I've called it the founding mothers because we get a lot of rhetoric in the movement about the founding fathers of the movement. But these, if you like, are the founding mothers of the vegan social movement. And again, I want to stress that when I talk about the vegan social movement, I'm talking not about the people who went plant based for the first time or were concerned about other animals or anything like that. These are the people who came together and put together a social movement, which they called a cause. So that's what that what marks them out uh, for me. Um, these are the people who formed the vegan social movement and also gave it its name, uh, of course. So this is part one of three of this kind of mini series within the time tunnels. It, it, won't, it won't be week on week, but it will be three in the end, if you like. And the first two people, are those you can see on your screen, Elsie Shrigley and uh, Dot uh, Watson or Dorothy Morgan, as uh, she was. And um, Elsie Shrigley was also called Sally Shrigley. So <laughs> there's a lot of name play going on. Now, a general point that we say at this stage is that the demographics of the animal movement or the movements, so whether you're talking animal welfare, or animal rights or animal liberation, it's the same for all of them. Um, it's been revealed that most people involved are and always have been women. For example, there's an interesting thing that I found in the Washington Post from 2019. And they say, we found that political conservatives and more religious Americans were less likely to support animal rights. Women were much more likely than men to support them, the animal rights movement. Most interestingly, however, we found that attitudes about LGBT rights, universal health care, welfare of the poor, improving conditions of African Americans, and supporting birthright citizenship for US born children of undocumented uh, immigrants were all strongly associa associated with views about animal rights and they conclude in other words people who supported an expansive concept of human rights and welfare were also most likely to support animal rights so that part of the survey that we're focused on of course today is the fact that most people in the movement are, are women and kind of always have been but then there is a movement issue that feminists have pointed out, like this one. In the patriarchal space of non-human animal rights activism, the voices and con uh, contributions of many women who helped build the movement are generally silenced or forgotten. That's a bait from the vegan feminist uh, network. It's claimed that even in, in a movement then with a membership historically and currently dominated by women, women's voices are often the least heard. Now, the very first version of, of this time tunnel talk 
that I ever did was for VegFest. And so I remembered when I came into the movement, and we talk about the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, it coincided with the time when women were very, very prominent uh, in the movement, or at least in the movement that I knew, uh, i.e. the British movement uh, spreading over to the North American one. For example, in Britain, people like Paddy Broughton and Margaret Manzoni were the management, really, of the BYV, the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection. Angela Walder was their scientific advisor at the time. Jean Pink, she founded Animal Aid in 1977. Juliet Gelatly was and still is the prime mover of uh, Viva. Jan Creamer founded uh, ADI, which stands for Animal Defenders International. And she worked for the NAVS, which is the National Antivivisection Society. Louise Wallace was the NAVS regional campaigns officer in the 1980s. And then she moved to the Vegan Society. And she is the person who initiated the annual World Vegan Day uh, events. Mimi and Jenny Spence, I remember from my time sabbing, ran the Essex Hunt Saboteurs Association. Muriel the Lady Dowding was co-founder of Beauty Without Cruelty and also active in the Lord Dowding Fund for Humane Research. And then when it comes to authors, we have people like Rebecca Hall, who published Voiceless Victims, probably not a name that is much known now. But we've also got Bridget Brophy, wrote a uh, very controversial, not controversial, but um, influential uh, article in 1965 about animal rights. Then we've got books by Ruth Harrison and Rachel Carsons. We've got Ingrid Newkirk in the States, founding uh, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And in Ireland, we have people like Bernie Wright and Nuala Donlan, who were amongst the co-founders of a group called AFAR, which stands for Alliance for Animal Rights. So when I came into the movement, it was really interesting. Women were very prominent. But the general idea is that, is that there's a visibility. Can we bring that back up? I'll, I'll, I'll address that. I think this subject is something I need to write a poem about, yeah. <laughs> need more research. Yeah. Do, 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 I like I like that. W P O T V S M. Oh great. Yes, they are indeed. So the issue now, I suppose, and there's times when this is worse and sometimes better, as it were, is the general invisibility of women you know and that applies to the start of the vegan social movement so much so that samantha calvert this is dr calvert of the vegan society now i'm not quite sure what post she holds now but she was the head of communications and she wrote in veggie vision tv which is still going and run by karen ridges another strong woman of the movement, she described Elsie Shrigley as a shadowy figure in the movement, despite her vast importance in its earliest years. You know, so one of the pioneers of the movement is seen as a shadowy figure, and you'll see that being repeated really with, with what's to come. So in August 1944, Elsie Beatrice Shrigley, often known as Sally for some reason, don't ask me why, I don't know that bit, joined with Donald Watson in pushing for a non-dairy section of the Vegetarian Society. So we've, you know, we've covered this uh, already in a previous um, time tunnel. And so we saw then that the Vegetarian Society, in a friendly kind of way, said no to this idea of a non-dairy section. And they basically said, no, just strike out on your own. And so that's what they did. And then hence, the vegan social movement was born in 1944. However, Shrigley herself was involved in the internal um, affairs and issues of uh, the vegetarian society for many years after 1944. And also that that's the case with many of the other 
vegan pioneers. They talked at the International Vegetarian Union Congresses in the late 1940s, throughout the 1950s, into the 1960s, and sometimes as late as 1980. Um, so this goes back to something really that, um, that Donald Watson developed, which is the kind of veganism, veganism is critical of vegetarianism, but shouldn't be a question of attacking vegetarians. So that, that, was, that was a distinction that they made uh, then. Now, going back again to the formation of the movement, uh, this is what Shrigley herself uh, said. I'm not, I'm not going to read this all, all this out, just some of it. She's talking about 1944 to 1965. What memories I have of those years. The first meeting on Sunday, November the 5th, 1944. Bracket, a sunny day, which is, <laughs> which is always interesting, the fact that um, a British person would have to mark the fact that it was sunny in November. <laughs> At the Attic Club near Holland Station. So this is in London, where the name vegan was decided and future plans discussed. The meetings, social and annual general meetings were very enthusiastic. And then we have some of the early issues. In, in the 1950s, some vegans were ill. And I remember with gratitude the help given to us by many vegetarian doctors and Dr. F. Uh, Wokes. Um, not woke, Wokes. And, um, it's interesting that because you know we tend to think of, of vegetarian doctors and certainly vegan doctors as something that is rather new, but they existed uh, even back then. And then she said towards the bottom, I am more thrilled than most that the society is celebrating its uh, 21st um, birthday. So uh, this is her recollection of the founding of the movement, this little kind of band of people who got together and just did what the vegetarians said, strike out on, on your own. They didn't expect that they would have to do it. So suddenly these people who were pushing for a section of the veg vegetarian society found themselves starting an entirely new social movement, which, which is not what they expected. In the third edition of the Vegan News, and that was published in May 1945, Donald Watson reports on the formation of a temporary committee of the Vegan Society. The committee held meetings uh, every month and they'd held one earlier in April. And they began the process of expanding the concerns of the so-called non-dairy vegetarians far beyond what was called in those days, the milk issue. And Watson writes this about the new movement's aims. It was unanimously decided that the society, which had developed from a small group of non-dairy vegetarians, should work for the abolition, not only of all food of animal origin, but also of commodities made from animal products, in particular, those from the slaughterhouse. So this essentially is the start of the evolution of what we now regard as vegan philosophy, which was done finished, if you like, by about 1955. So it took quite a, a long time. Uh, going back to what Shrigley said about the health problems, uh, they really had to prove in the very early years that um, it was feasible to live on a plant uh, diet. And so that's what they set out to do. And again, I mentioned this in another time tunnel because they were told by a lot of doctors I don't know whether the vegetarians were included in on this, but they were told by their friends as well that they were going to die. They were literally going to die. And so they had to prove in the early years of the society that it was actually feasible to live on a plant uh, diet. So Shrigley becomes elected as a committee member and also a committee member of the London Vegan Group. The London Vegan Group was formed in July 1945 and it was initially separated from the National Vegan Society. And Watson reports that she gave a talk at their first meeting, arguing that the vegan's diet was clean, humane, and logical. By the time of the publication of the spring 1946 edition of The Vegan, 
So it changed from the vegan news to the vegan. So this was the first properly printed version of the vegan social movement magazine. So even there is interesting because it took almost kind of two years for this, or at least 18 months for this uh, to happen. It It's interesting from our point of view now in the internet, internet age, how, how kind of slow things were. And so they were founded November 44, but they didn't even get a proper magazine together until 1946, you know, that kind of thing. Shrigley was announced as the Society's Press and Minutes uh, Secretary, which is an interesting thing. And uh, again, you could probably make some feminist related points um, about that, I imagine. In 1947, Shrigley had begun a series in the magazine entitled Food, uh, sorry, Report of Food Investigations. Now, this is interesting. 1947, she concentrated on chocolates, sweets, and biscuits in the autumn edition of the mag. So I suppose a concentration on chocolate, sweets, and biscuits meant that even back there, then, she really knew how vegans uh, ticked, and so she knew what was um, of concern to them. But more seriously than that is these are the end of the war years. And so that meant that rationing was still continuing. And so there was a lot of hardship after the war. And possibly, especially those early vegan pioneers who had declared themselves as conscientious objectors. So that was quite interesting. So it must have meant that sweet stuffs in those days were a great treat because we would immediate uh, years after the war and you know things were trying to get back to normal, I suppose. I suppose it's surprising though, that there seems to be no shortage of chocolate suitable for vegans in 1947, which again, is not something you'd, you'd expect, is it? You'd expect that there would be no such thing, but th that's, that's not the case. Now, Sam Calvert, the um, historian, said that Shrigley's early work on the products suitable for vegans, and this is one of the things that the vegan society really kind of went for, because there was no labeling back in those days. You've got, we've got to remember that. Again, things were much, much different in those days. Everything was slower, but everything was more difficult. There was no labels on the jars and, and the packets. And so it all had to be done by letter and then confirmation, keep uh, tracking it, this kind of thing. She said, um, Calvert says that Shrigley's work laid the groundwork for something called the Animal Free Shopper, which was published every year by the Vegan Society for a long time. It's a very small little booklet, which you used to be able to put in your pocket. And all vegans of my generation would have one. And it was kind of a, a godsend, really, because you, you'd go into a supermarket and you get your little shopper out and it would virtually tell you what you know was okay and what uh, wasn't really. Uh, it was obviously before the age uh, of the internet. Shrigley was to work for the vegan movement in one capacity or another for 33 years until she died in 1978, which is a pretty good uh, track record. She was, as said, a vegan delegate at the Congresses of the International Vegetarian Union. She was a, a a long-time member of the Vegan Society's committee. And then in the 1960s, she was the organization's deputy president, and then she became the president uh, as well. And so in 1967, in a warm tribute entitled Vegan Since 1944, by someone called SNC. Now, I've never been able to figure out who that was, but I think it's probably Serena Coles, a person called Serena Coles, who was a committee member of the Vegan Society at this time, she wrote an obituary relief or a tribute saying, Elsie Shrigley was remembered as a pioneer of the movement who was still playing an active part in the outworking of the idealists who first brought the society into being. Now, this, this little statement is really interesting. Um, th this happened a great deal. A, a lot of the early pioneers and then and then the ones who came like 10 years later they were urging the people in the movement 
to stay kind of faithful to the to the developing philosophy and the radical view of the founders of the movement and that went right through to about the 1980s you can you can find little statements where and people like uh, Watson looking back you know 50 years and all that kind of stuff they would say you know don't remember uh, don't forget the you know the values of the pioneers they're very important we we want them to be upheld we don't want any kind of slippage uh, if you like uh, sadly slippage is exactly what's happened but that's what they wanted they wanted uh, a constituent um consistency of radical values which has sadly not really occurred now emphasizing once again the fact that the second world war was an important factor in the lives of many of the movement's co-founders it was noted that Shrigley acted as a leader of the street, it was called, in the what was called the fire guard service. So again, some of the people who wouldn't fight in the war uh, ended up fighting fires in terms of being, you know, the bomb cities, um, etc. Thanking Shrigley for her service to the vegan cause, SNC finished with, she had reminded us that the vegan society was formed because of correspondence in the vegetarian messenger of Leslie Cross, who inspired her to become a non-dairy vegetarian. Now, Leslie Cross, um, who is a man, <laughs> even though um, it can be confusing in that sense, Leslie Cross becomes a central player in the evolution of vegan philosophy. And so he will be a subject of a time tunnel uh, to come okay so now we move to our second person dorothy morgan now in the acknowledgments of a book called ecofeminism feminist intersections with other animals and the earth which is edited by carol j adams and laurie gruen this is uh, 2014 Dorothy Morgan is credited with coining the word vegan by taking the first three words and the last two words of vegetarian and putting them together. <laughs> She's also credited, I'm not quite sure if this is the right word, with marrying uh, Donald Watson. She helped to found the Vegan Society and she promoted veganism as both a worldview, this emerging philosophy that I was talking about, and, and a word. You know, the, I mean, the word didn't exist. It was a brand new word that um, that we were dealing with uh, for a brand new cause, a brand new social movement. Now, many of you will probably know that a number of other names were under active consideration uh, throughout this kind of very early period. These are some of them. So all Vega was suggested. So basically this little group of people, they, they were kind of, you know, doing a bit of a focus group and saying, okay, we've got to come up with a name. We're not non-dairy vegetarians anymore, so what are we? So All Vega was one. Dairy Bands, the Total Vegetarian Group, uh, Neo Vegetarian, Vitan was one, and Benivore. So I always say at this point, I'm rather glad that they picked on the word uh, vegan because none of those other ones sound <laughs> very good to me but um but there you go now this is interesting because um this is the donald watson archive so we've got some sociologists working on the donald watson archive and their names are there kate stewart irish crane and matthew cole and um well i think i think they kind of pointed out or at least it is true that as another shadowy figure, really, there's not a lot out there about Dot Watson. Um, but it is claimed that uh, that Dot Watson and Notch Wrigley uh, co-founded or co-coined the word vegan along with her. I don't think he was a husband at the time. Could could have been at the time. So there's not a lot of, um, out there about uh, Dot or Dorothy Morgan, who became Dorothy Watson, often usually called Dot uh, Watson. There, there is a story, though, that really seems to suggest a heck of a lot about her character, I think. And uh, this is this. And this is, takes place in 1951. Um, 
Now, a neighbor of Donald and Dorothy had a glass conservatory. Now, these were new at the time. And so um, birds were not used to a building made almost of glass, even though I suppose um, greenhouses must have existed in those days. But as it were, a big kind of structure at the side of a building was kind of new to them. So not long after the construction of this conservatory, uh, birds began to crash into the glass because they couldn't see it. On one occasion, a barely alive female blackbird was found. She had collided with a pane of glass and was lying with one eye hanging out of its socket. So even though this is Dorothy and, uh, uh, and Donald now, even though they thought the best thing to do might be to put the bird out of her misery, they just couldn't bring themselves to do it. So they left her in uh, with some water and tried to keep her comfy, as it were, for overnight, both expecting that she would be dead in the morning. However, the next day, she was alive and her eye seemed to have popped back into place. So everything seemed to be grand uh, with this little bird. So they happily released her. And two days later, Dorothy Watson was in their yard. I think she was actually putting the washing out, <laughs> another stereotype. And she claims that a blackbird flew by her, dipping in flight. And she was convinced that this was the same bird saying thank you uh, to her. So whether that's true, I don't know, but it's a nice thing to, to believe to be true, isn't it? A nice little story. Now, this is interesting. This, uh, these are scenes from, we're getting to the end now, this, scenes from a Patreon post by an author called Lee Hall. And um, this essentially is Dorothy uh, and Donald's uh, grave. So she visited this church, which is called Crosswaith Church, and it's in near Keswick which is a place called Cumbria. So if you, you probably can't see it very well, but the kind of bottom left there, there's a picture of, of Britain with Keswick kind of pointed out. So um, if people know the Lake District in the northwest of, of England, just below Scotland, that, that's where we, we're talking about. And so, um, yeah, Lee Hall said... Uh, Donald Watson uh, married Dorothy sometime after the war ended. The pair settled in Keswick, Cumbria. They became active members of the Cumbrian Vegetarian Society. But by then, and together with Elsie Shrigley and about two dozen like-minded people, they had already launched the vegan uh, movement. Now, what's interesting here, all right, Veganic Graham, we rescued a blackbird ages ago, got him back to good health. He came back often. All oh, right, yeah, you see, that's that's great, isn't it? Brilliant little stories, those. I love those. So, um, so this is a this is the grave, really, um, of the two of them, and it's um, an incredibly picturesque uh, place overlooking the lakes. Um, this is a a more maybe a more clear picture. It was it was bigger before, but I wanted to include the flowers in the bin because Lee Hall said that um, she wanted to uh, leave flowers, but she wouldn't buy any. And so she kind of raided the bin uh, for some secondhand ones, uh, if you like. She also says that Dorothy and uh, Donald were not among the notable people listed by the church uh, buried there. So they actually, they actually had difficulty finding the grave in the end. There was no headstone, for example. And so what you get really is just this little mark in the ground, a little a, a little mark in the ground, which is where they were buried. So they didn't make a big deal um, out, out of that. You can see all around Lee Hall in that picture, there's, you know, kind of formal headstones. and But what she's looking at is the actual grave of... Um, of the two or two of the big uh, founders of the vegan movement. Right. So that is your first two of the powerful women 
of the vegan movement, Elsie Shrigley and Dorothy Morgan, who became Dorothy uh, Watson. So I haven't been looking at the chat whatsoever. So if I've missed anything, um, they can go back up. But also, um, if not, um, we can leave it a couple of minutes just to see. Yes, that's right, Deb. They did make uh, their mark as well. And um, I think, in fact, uh, just before Donald died, he gave an interview and um, I think um, somebody said, you know, what, what what was your achievement? And I think he said that not many people get to be the co-founder of um, a radical cause that could change history, essentially, uh, because, of course, you know, they had a big, um, very expansive view about, you know, what was the potential for for veganism. And so that was what they thought. And uh, so he said not many people get to do that, as it were, and so that is true. Right, okay, now, a wonderful story indeed, that's good, I'm glad you liked it, amazing history, thank you for sharing this with us, and um, as I said, so that's just the first one of a little mini-series within the Time Tunnel uh, series, so we'll be back um, with something else uh, next time, and then we shall revisit some of the uh, powerful uh, women uh, later. So thanks everyone for tuning in and I um, hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again on the Vegan Time Tunnel. Thanks a lot. Hey, Earthlings, and um, welcome along to another Rogers or The Time Tunnel. So um, I think we're up to uh, number six now in the new series. So we've got a um, an intro. Uh, so if you go to my YouTube channel and then you go to the playlist, uh, Vegan Time Tunnel, then you'll see them all. So the very first one after that intro one was about the anti section movement in Britain. Then we had one about the Animals film, which was a groundbreaking film from 1981. Uh, then we had um, something about Operation Valentine. Uh, that was a raid on Valentine's Day, which is why, why it occurred then. And then we had um, the origins of the vegan social movement, where I talk about the vegetarian society become pregnant with, with vegans, and eventually the vegan society was, was born. That's the way it was put. And then the last one last week, was an account of unnecessary fuss, which I regard as still the most powerful anti-view section uh, movie uh, of all time. And, and the reason for that is that um, is that the view sectors filmed it themselves. Okay, so that's um, that's what we're doing. Um, we're trying to build up an archive. So the idea is week on, on week, we're gonna build up an archive and then eventually we'll have something of substance, hopefully for people to come into the movement and learn a bit about the history of the movement that they've joined, which is always an important uh, thing, I think. So welcome along then, as I said, to the Vegan Time Tunnel. Hmm, so as you can see then, we're, we're into um, a relatively big name in the vegan movement. Uh, we're talking about Donald uh, Watson. He was born in uh, 1910 and died in 2005, which made him 95 years old. Um, actually, he died in November, so that was World Vegan Month. Uh, so I'm not quite sure if he, if, he knew, if he knew it was that, timed it in that way. Right, so in terms of um, resources for today, because the timeline really from today's show is going to be 1917 through to about 2005. So that's that's the kind of area we're looking at. So this is the resources that I'm using. Just going to drop that down to that screen. So you, you might be able to see that. I know people on the on phones are not going to see that. So I'll just run through them. 
So we've got um, the very, very first vegan news, which Don Watson produced in November uh, 1944. Then we've got the vegan, which is, is what the journal became called. And that's spring uh, 46. Then we've got the vegan again, uh, summer 88. Then we've got the vegan again, which was autumn uh, 94. You can find all these if you go to um, a site called Issue, which is I-S-S-U-U. You can, you can find the entire archive of all the vegan society journals. Then there's also something from the vegan society, which is called Ripened by Human Determination, 70 Years of the Vegan Society, which was written by the historian, not sure if she's still the historian, but Samantha Calvert. So that was 2014. And then we have the Wiley Blackwell Encyclopedia of Social and Political Movements. Uh, that's the source. And we've got um, something by Earthling Ed, which is called A Message for All Vegans. I'm not quite sure when that was written. And then we've got Boycott Veganism, which was um, a pamphlet put out by, well, it, was, it wasn't, uh, <clears throat> the, the authors were unknown but um, it was believed to be Wayne Chong from DXE. And then finally, we've got the um, Donald Watson archive, and that's some sociologists uh, working to produce that, and that's Kate Stewart, Matthew Cole, and Iris uh, Cr uh, Crane. In fact, um, one oddity, I think, from that archive is, is this, just, just to start us off in, 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 in an interesting way. Uh, this is um, a handwritten by Donald Watson, a handwritten thing uh, called The Lifestyle of Donald Watson. So this is really interesting to go through this. Uh, <clears throat> number one and two are no surprise. It says, number one, no meat or fish. Number two, no dairy products or eggs. Uh, number three, no alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. Number four, which is interesting um, in terms of veganism right now, is uh, no medicine or vitamin pills or cosmetics. So that's interesting in the sense that, you know, quite a lot of the early vegan pioneers didn't um, supplement in, in the way that uh, we're all supposed to nowadays. Uh, number five is adequate sleep, which is a good idea. I wish I could get, get it sometimes. Um, number six is adequate exercise. Number seven is some food taken raw every day. Um, number eight is all food organic which possibly might have been controversial in those days because of the bone meal and, and all that kind of stuff and the, and the blood meal and all that. And number nine, uh, weight uh, to be normal, whatever that means. Um, number 10 is interesting, avoid crowds. So Donald Watson didn't like crowds. Number 11 is DIY religion. We'll, we'll come on to, the, to what they thought about organized religion uh, a little later. Uh, number 12, uh, free from monetary debt was an important value for Donald Watson, which is really interesting. Um, where are we? Uh, number 13, no unprovoked, I think it's unprovoked aggression. That's the, that's the hardest bit to, to read. Number 14, only raw sugar used. And number 15, um, <laughs> this is really interesting uh, because uh, Donald Watson was a Yorkshire person, the same as me. And, um, he says this is the last one, no cold baths or sunbathing. I, I always think that's really funny because in Yorkshire, you probably don't get much ch chance uh, to sunbathe and you probably would be um, <laughs> be a bit of a masochist to have a cold bath in, in Yorkshire, I would think. Yeah, Michael says avoiding crowds rings true to me. Yeah, I, I, actually, I don't, I don't like crowds funny enough. It's some, something that, that I tend to avoid as well. Also from the Donald Watson archive is a little statement by Watson, or it's a letter written um, in 1995. He kind of gets this wrong in a way because he says, I doubt if many people will be interested in the details of my life. And then he, he starts to talk about what we can see as vegan values. This is really interesting. Unless, of course, veganism is seen to have cracked the code that has beaten everyone else. Uh, to show for the first time how humanity can live healthily and at peace in this hostile world. This uh, may be some time ahead, that was 1995. Uh, uh, but it's really interesting in the sense that uh, 
we're going to come back to this theme because it becomes a very big theme within Donald Watson's uh, life. Okay, so he was born on the 2nd of uh, September, 1910, uh, in Mexborough in South Yorkshire. He was a son of a school headmaster. So I suppose that makes him middle class, I, I guess. And as I said, he died in November 2005. So he was 95 uh, years old. <clears throat> so as a child, the young Donald Watson would holiday with his grandmother and also her son. And so she had a farm and uh, innocently, Donald described these holidays as heavenly. He was delighted because he found himself as a young kid surrounded by lots of interesting other animals. There were horses and the cats and dogs, cows, chickens, a cockerel, sheep uh, and pigs. So it eventually struck the young Donald that all these other animals had some function. And you might have heard me before talk about the way that humans tend to orient towards other animals in functional terms. He said all these other animals seem to have things that they give to humans. He said, quote, I realized they all gave something, but then that raised a question in his mind. Yeah, but what, what about the pigs? He said, I could never understand what the pigs did. All the other animals gave something, but I couldn't for the life of me see what the pigs gave. And they were such friendly creatures, always glad to see me and grateful for almost anything that was thrown to them in the sty. And so that, that was the first little kind of puzzle in Watson's mind. What, what did the pigs give? One day he goes downstairs for breakfast and Granny, on this occasion, is not alone. Four strangers uh, are with her. And he writes this. It wasn't long before the business of killing one of the pigs began. No attempt was made to keep me away from the scene. I just went there full of interest to see what all this was about. And I still have vivid recollections of the whole process from start to finish, including all the screams, of course. And it's interesting now, isn't it? Because, um, I mean, people like Grumpy Vegan Grandad, they're doing live streams from pig slaughterhouses now because obviously by changing to the gassing method, then it means that the pigs do um, scream a lot. They're very vocal when they, when they meet their deaths, essentially. My friend, Bernie Wright, who runs um, the Alliance for Animal Rights in Dublin, she used to live in a place called the Liberties in Dublin and she said it was very close, it was very close to a pig slaughterhouse and she says she remembers as a child herself that uh, the, the pigs would, would, would scream and try to get away. In fact, a couple, a couple of them ran, ran down the street to get, to get away once. So Donald Watson was shocked to discover that animal farms are actually killing machines. He says it's, they were a death row where every creature's days were numbered. And his kind of young mind concluded that if he were to write a report on what you might call man's progress, he would say that, um, that we could do better. Now, all of this, Watson reports, paved his way to veganism and also the formation of the very first vegan social movement organization, uh, the Vegan Society. And it's interesting because he saw no other social movement offering as much as the vegan movement. And he came to see veganism as the salvation of humanity, which sounds a bit grand, but we're going to go into to what he, he was talk, talking about a little later. Now, a lot's been written by Donald uh, about Donald Watson, and some of it is true. What's not true is that Watson single-handedly invented veganism, or that he wrote a comprehensive definition of veganism in 1944. Those things uh, are not true. In fact, um, he had a good sense of humor and he, he said he was always keen to spread the blame for the foundation of the vegan social movement among several others like Elsie Shrigley, for example. But he did also uh, say this, he said, I hesitate to single 
uh, out anyone, but I would say Leslie Cross and Arthur Ling must be put in the records as being two outstanding faithful contributors to our cause. Now, now that's interesting in the sense that they didn't use the language of social movements back then, but they did see themselves as being in a cause to bring about uh, radical change. And that's going to come back um, it, uh, in, in, the, in, in later thing. And in terms of, um, let me just put that on full screen for a second. Uh, so that's Leslie Cross at the top, Arthur Ling, both involved in the plant mill, the plant milk uh, pioneers they were. So I always I always look at that picture and I think this is this is when Leslie Cross was involved in artificial insemination, but it wasn't really. This is when they were they were getting um, involved with the the plant milks. Okay, so I'm just going to drop that out for a little while. So in terms of actually coined the word vegan, the sociologist researching the Donald Watson archive, as I said, was Kate Stewart, Matthew Cole, and Irish uh, Irish Crane. He says that Watson claimed that he and his wife. Dorothy came up with the idea jointly at a dance, which I think was in uh, Leicester. There are some claims that I, um, that Elsie Shrigley came up with the idea or, or came up with the idea jointly with Watson, but Watson himself said it was him and his wife Dorothy, who was probably Dorothy Morgan at, at the time. So now this is an interesting movement issue because for a variety of reasons, and you will probably heard me say this, before, some members of the 21st century animal advocacy movement have been attempting and are attempting to reduce and slim down and also make quite shallow the kind of overarching philosophy of vegan. Now, these claims uh, are not accurate, I think, as we're going to, to see um, in a while. Donald Watson was once asked if he had any message for new vegans. So let me bring this back in. He said, yes, he said, um, I would like them to take a broad view of what veganism stands for. Something beyond finding new alternatives to, shall we say, scrambled eggs or to on toast or a new recipe for a Christmas cake. He added, I would like them to realize that they're onto something really big. In his later life, he was invited to write as the kind of president of the Vegan Society for The Vegan, the Journal of the Society. And he regularly thanked the people who had followed his generation of vegan pioneers for remaining steadfast in their adherence to vegan philosophical principles. But he warned in the very first Vegan Society Bulletin in 44 that nothing is automatic and that social movements need to, to guard against things sliding away from their core ideas. He also wrote to the aforementioned Arthur Ling, and this is 2003, he wrote this. I'm going to put this uh, full screen to give you a better chance uh, of seeing it. He said, since veganism by definition claims to help animals and people, the word people was underlined but by Watson himself, the vegan society must do its part in showing how to bring this about, uh, a letter to Arthur Ling, um, as I said. Now let's just drop back um, a little while um, because something other than being confronted with the realities of animal farming when he was a kid was to have a profound effect on the young Donald Watson. His politics and his values were forever shaped by the events of the Second World War. And he said that the Second World War absolutely sickened him. He, he said it was a, a terrible, terrible thing to have gone through. In uh, 1994, looking back on the first 50 years of the vegan movement, Watson noted that people were shattered by the tragedy of the war. So much so that in 1944, as the conflict grew, grew, drew to a close, most had little time, uh, quote, to fuss about the fate of a few animals. But the vegans had a different idea. 
And this is very telling in terms of what becomes the scope of the vegan movement that was yet to evolve at this stage. Watson said that the vegan pioneers would never agree to the general popular notion that the war on animals that were going on was a just war. In fact, to the contrary, it was the position of the vegans that humanity's tyranny towards humans and other animals is connected. And he said that the vegan pioneers were not religious in any orthodox sense, but they did take the commandment, thou shalt not kill seriously and applied it to both humans and other than human animals. And so Watson said this, if our vision of a better world was a dream, it was a dream to escape the nightmare of a world overflowing with evil. The humans of this world overflowing with evil, he states, saw nothing wrong with killing other animals. He said that we, on the other hand, felt that we were facing the issue of morality at its most basic. Uh, in terms of his personal life, uh, Donald Watson lost several uh, friends during uh, World War II, including colleagues that he knew from the vegetarian movement. So he became very saddened by the idea of killing, and he was particularly saddened by the idea of being expected to kill people who were total strangers to him. And he picked out the 50,000 people killed in one raid on Dresden uh, once. And this is the devastation um, that resulted in that. He said their bodies subsequently piled up and burnt because there was no way of burying so many. So Watson saw that there was no choice but for him to become a conscientious objector, uh, a, C, a CO. And in fact, um, uh, two or three other pioneers of the vegan movement also uh, refused to fight. He said this, he said, uh, it was a terrible dilemma for anybody with high principles to see thousands, millions of people killed because the whole idea was so absurd that humanity should still at this late stage in its evolution be trying to solve its problems by this evil method. So I don't know if you noticed, but as I said that, I brought it up to date and got rid of all the, the man and all that kind of stuff. That's, uh, that's the, usual, the usual way of, of writing in those days, of course. So by now, Donald Watson, during the war, is a night school teacher on reduced pay for being a conscientious objector. They, they had reduced rations. They had reduced pay. But he's also a member of the auxiliary fire service. So they would fight fires, but they wouldn't fight against uh, other human beings, and they wouldn't kill other animals either. In fact, um, he does report that there was a real possibility that um, his own death uh, was close in 1940 because he believed that um, at least some of the German air raids uh, that destroyed large parts of Coventry, the city of Coventry, and that's um, a picture of that devastation. It's really um, thing. I'll just put, put it a little bit bigger on your screen. He said that um, he thinks that the bombs were actually meant for Leicester, which, which was also, and still is obviously, um, in the Midlands in England. And that's where he was living at the time. And um, it used to be the case that uh, in the war, they used to have blackouts. And, um, and what they did in the Peak District, which is a moor area of the north of England, not far from the Midlands, they would set up lights to make it look like cities from the air. And they, wa they, they wanted to kind of, um, obviously, the, the German bombers to, to bomb that rather than the real uh, cities, of course. And, of course, from a vegan point of view, we would think about all the other animals who would be killed on the moors, of course. But um, that's what their plan was. Now, Watson mentioned in one of the quotes that I've already uh, talked about, uh, humanity's evolution. Now, this idea became really central to what the movement talked about in the very early years. Um, the pioneers appeared to see the values um, embedded within veganism as challenging the barbarity that had created both war and also exploitation. And so they said that veganism should be seen as part of the moral evolution of humanity. And Watson stated that he liked to think 
that the vegan movement is the greatest movement that ever was. In 2002, for example, when he was 92 years old, he was 92 years old and 140 days old, he said that veganism is the greatest of movements. And he said, because it's the only one now that can save humanity. Now, that might seem rather arrogant uh, as a claim, but he, he basically declared that all the other movements were lesser than veganism because they had a limited vision of the future, whereas the, the vegan vision of the future was very expansive. He said that such lesser movements were as people rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. So he used that kind of cliche, he called it a common cliche of the time, whereas they could be helping the vegans who were busy shining their searchlight on the iceberg, which, quote, is going to be the end of the whole show. Now, this, um, this here is a, a meme that, that I produced. It's not very good, but I tried to kind of articulate this idea. So you've got the iceberg, the, exploit um, the exploitation of sentient life uh, up there at the top. And then you've got the good ship veganism <laughs> with the searchlight. And then the quote, uh, as, as I said, uh, as well. So making somewhat of a prophetic pronouncement, Watson points out that nature rebels against any species that becomes nu too numerous, usually by food shortages, but also by disease. And he said both of which are now rampaging ahead in the human community. Oh, let's just drop that back down. And he's, he argued then that vegans alone at this stage have the possible solutions to this crisis. Uh, so it's not an exaggeration to say that the early vegan vision of the future was pretty spectacular and, of course, could easily be dis dismissed as utopian. But it must be remembered that people are a product of their time, you know, and it, it, when you think about what they went through, uh, it's remarkable. For example, there's these two sickening, shattering wars involving populations from all over the planet, which is why they're called world wars, right? I know that's a contentious issue. They saw the ri rise of the far right in the shape of the Third Reich. They experienced carpet bombing and widespread destruction, the laying waste of entire cities throughout Europe. And then they became, uh, they learnt firsthand about the death camps, the ghettos, and about the realities of war as a general matter. I always, I always point out at this stage that um, for a generation like ours who probably learnt about this through history books or films even, uh, and, now, and now social media, internet, that kind of stuff, that's one thing. But to actually, to actually live it like they did and to discover it firsthand, I mean, the shock of finding out about concentration camps and what was going on, you know, it, it's, it's hard for us to really appreciate uh, what, what, what they felt, I, I suppose. But um, that did make them think about humanity. In fact, um, in a more general sense, the trauma of warfare on individuals is now well known. There's lots of research on that now. Um, but some relatives of veterans of the war various wars, they say that their fathers, their mothers, their aunts and uncles, for example, they couldn't ever bear to talk about what they'd seen and what they'd witnessed. And so often the details of what they went through went with them to the their own uh, graves, if you like. Vegans saw something extra as well. Some of the vegan pioneers saw a trauma that had damaged and degraded human society. They feared that their own recent history had revealed some form of de-evolution of humanity. They thought that humans had become much more savage and much more likely to see violence as a means to resolve problems and disputes. So the early vegan pioneers believed that veganism vision, that exploitation of humans and non-humans were connected, could result in a vegan future that could correct or even eliminate this violence. And this is a violence that they saw all around them. And Watson said uh, this, 
we don't know the spiritual advancements that long-term veganism, I mean, not um, over years or even decades, but over generations, would have on human life. And he added this. It would certainly be a different civilization and the first one in the whole of our history that would truly deserve the title of being a civilization, uh, full stop. Now, <clears throat> finally, just to bring us uh, much more up to date, there are a relatively recent calls within the vegan movement that suggest that veganism is not enough, and even that veganism itself is a rather passive uh, posture. For example, in recent years, you've had prominent social media activists suggesting that vegans will simply stand by and watch humans attack other animals in particular. They will stand there and watch somebody um, kick dogs. And there's also an inf infamous manifesto entitled Boycott Veganism uh, by DXE. And that concludes this, that if we want to stand up for animals, then we should stop calling ourselves vegan, stop asking others to go vegan, and even stop using the words, uh, the word vegan. Now, I regard this as a pretty simplistic notion, and it appears to go out of their way to uh, misrepresent the meaning of what veganism is. And it certainly ignores the views of the pioneers of our movement. Uh, they're dismissed and distorted in centers such as this, which again is from that manifesto. When we examine how the go vegan message frames the animal rights debate, we see how we are playing into our opponent's hands. The concept of veganism necessarily focuses on the human who chooses a particular lifestyle. That lifestyle may be informed by ethical principles, no doubt, but the framing has been set. The debate is about human choices and interests rather than animal rights and brutality. Now, I tend to reject this uh, manifesto uh, because it doesn't take into account the views of the people who started the vegan movement. And they said that not only did they set out to analyze the brutality that they had lived through, they also wanted to do something about it, this problem of humanity uh, as they saw it. And they often used words like humanity has sunk into a, you know, in, into a, a depression and veganism can, can bring it bring it bring us back out kind of thing now sociologists and social theorists and you've heard me say this before i'm sure say that social movements are claims makers in civil society social movements typically make claims about the problems that they say they have identified and donald watson famously suggested in 1944 that people need to be ripened up to new ideas such as veganism and he said he fully understands that change doesn't just happen. Social actors have to make it happen. In the very first edition of the Vegan News, Watson told his readers that there is an obvious danger of leaving the fulfillment of our, our ideals to prosperity. For prosperity may not have our ideals. Evolution can be retrogressive as well as progressive. Indeed, there seems always to be a strong gravitation the wrong way, unless existing standards are guarded and new visions honored. For this reason, we have formed our group. And on this occasion, um, as you can see, I've put all the emphasis in there. But I think this gives the lie to the idea that veganism is passive. Uh, as I said, they see themselves as part of a cause, doing stuff to bring about change. So I don't see there's anything passive about that. Indeed, in his 2014 chapter entitled The Greatest Cause on Earth, the historical formation of veganism as an ethical practice, sociologist Matthew Cole identifies the aims of the vegan movement as radically transformative and emancipatory. And he said this, he's gonna drop me out of that. He says the vegan ethos means the aim and object combines compassionate non-exploitation of other animals with an emancipated vegan self and a more compassionate human society. Vegan ethics from the beginning was directed towards these interconnected goals of transforming human beings 
and transforming human society, with both flowing from the foundational reconfiguration of human, non-human, animal relations. Now, I hope that's not too wordy, but um, he's basically saying that, you know, th the pioneers had a radical vision and they saw that what, um, what veganism stood for is kind of emancipation across the board, or, or as I tend to put it, ju justice for all. And Coles uh, goes on to say, the breathtaking scope of the transformative vision of the vegan pioneers may inspire a recentering of vegan ethics in the practice of an advocacy of all those who oppose exploitation in its myriad and pernicious forms. So Cole talks about exploitation not restricted to other animals only, just as the pioneers of the movement did. Donald Watson himself said that the movement opposed the exploitation of all sentient life, and he wrote that in 19. 45, a year after the, the movement was begun. Cole pointed out that from 1948 to 1951, the front strap line of the Vegan Society's magazine, the Vegan Society stated that its aim was to advocate, um, advocating living without exploitation. So far from just being a diet uh, or only just about other animals, the driving philosophy of the vegan social movement represents a revolution that is arguably needed more now than it was in the 1940s and 1950s when these radical ideas evolved and emerged. So it seems a little bit shocking to me that their revolution, their revolutionary vision for a less violent future right across the board is being somewhat cast aside within the 21st century by some people in the vegan movement. And so I always say let's let's get back, you know, veganism back on track uh, in a sense, and get back to you know the kind of wider uh, vision of the pioneers. So I just want to finish with um, a, a couple of um, more quotes from from Watson. There are there are a lot more, but it's good to have more in in, in the same place. <clears throat> uh, the vegan believes that if we were to be true emancipators of uh, animals, we must re renounce absolutely our traditional and conceited attitude that we have the right to use them to serve our needs. We must supply these needs by other means. And then this is one that I made uh, an entirely separate meme from. If the vegan ideal of non-exploitation were generally adopted, it would be the greatest peaceful re revolution ever known, abolishing vast in industries, and establishing new ones in the better interests of men and other uh, animals uh, alike. Uh, the vegan considers the abolition of the slaughterhouse as a reform of first importance in the reconstruction of human society. For as long as it remains, society has no morality, and without a morality, humans can never establish themselves a decent order. And I'm not going to read all this out, just the, the bottom bit, which is veganism is a powerful word describing a powerful reform. It challenges orthodox morality over a, while, a wide field, renouncing the ideas that man has the right to exploit animals. And in doing it, it sets new horizons in the evolutionary uh, trend towards emancipation. So that was the 19... 60s and then finally we've got this which was i believe the year before and apologies if you can't see much of this um i can't see much of it but i'm, I'm going to read it out for you um i think this was uh, said i think the year before he died he was asked about his greatest achievement my greatest achievement question mark well it's in succeeding i think although i mustn't be uh, be the judge in my own estimation in achieving what I set out to do. One can hardly rise higher in one's opinion of one's life in general than to feel that I was instrumental in starting a great new movement which could uh, even not only change the course of things for humanity and the rest of creation, 
that alter man's expectation of surviving for much longer on this planet. So that was um, that was his almost like last public uh, statement uh, in a sense, and um, that then is the uh, the time tunnel. So uh, have I have I missed any um, have I missed any uh, have I missed any questions or points or if not, does anybody want to make any? Otherwise, we can uh, bid each other a fair, fairly well. <laughs> so, um, hi, Paul. Paul from what do you Galway? Paul from Galway. Yes. So, okay. So, um, I'll just I'll just wait. I'll just wait another minute, and uh, just in case anybody wants to um, say anything. Um, Yeah, well, that's that's a, that's that's true, isn't it? You know, people talk about uh, peace and love, and that you know, in fact, that's one of the um, that's one of the problems of the of the left, according to Steve Best. Steve Best in the Total Liberation talk, he says that he worked in the left, and it's the left that we have to forge alliances with, because their values and our values are, are almost the same. But he said that you you get this problem. They're, they're talking about peace and injustice and all this kind of stuff. And uh, he, as he put it, he said, you know, pa pass me another bucket of chicken wings type of thing. So, yeah, it is it is a problem. Okay. So, um, yeah. Also, good folks you can share da -da -da, on your socials. Indeed. Yeah. Share share it about the world. It, it is important, I think, for people coming into the movement to learn something at least about the values other, otherwise you get a lot of um misunderstandings um the, i i was interacting with somebody on on tiktok just yesterday uh, and they'd kind of got the definition completely wrong you know and so i kind of pointed it out and of course that that's a tricky thing to do as well nowadays you know if you if you um say well actually that's not totally true it's it can be quite difficult in social movement terms because um as as you know what do you think about watson's take at this moment in human society, well, I tend I tend to marry Watson's take with Reagan's take, which obviously is about things like um, bringing together emotion and rationality, um, but also this idea that we could climb out of of this abyss, if you like. I, I tend to think that things things like uh, COVID has shown that humanity is not particularly rational and so that mitigates against it i tend to think that when you see uh, people voting for people like D uh, donald trump in north america and boris johnson in britain the the idea the idea that, that those people are going to adopt vegan values at some stage in the future um is is a bit rough when when i see um dan shepherd going on live on tiktok outside the gas chambers in in manchester the, the comments are absolutely vile, absolutely disgusting comments uh, from from the people. Now, obviously, we know from a social psychology sense, we don't know that those comments are defensive. They're a defensive mechanism. So we do know that, and so you you can't take them at face value. But it it is it is pretty rough to see that. So so I I, w I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest that we're very very far along the 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 road as Watson saw it. Um, I mean, when when we do a time tunnel on um, on Leslie Cross, we'll see these themes uh, rehearsed all all over again. And this was like um, a few years later, in the sense that you know we're so violent now. We've, we we're a brutal species, uh, and we've got to adopt vegan values if we've got any chance of getting out of that. And I do think there's a lot in that. But there's also not a lot of evidence that it, it, it's happening. At the same time, obviously, we all talk about well, the last five years, veganism, this, that, and the other, <laughs> and then we've got the argument about well, what does that mean? You know, are we talking about, you know, I know it's a majority, but are we talking about cupcake vegans or are we talking about vegans? Are we talking about plant-based people? Um, <clears throat> there was a live today I saw, or a, a short today, about uh, Djokovic, the tennis player. And um, a big fuss about him not being vegan or 
or some some vegans said he was vegan and he's he's always just said he was plant based we we make a big mistake if if we do that i think um you know if we if we try and co-opt the plant based into the vegan uh, movement because it just causes confusion uh, I, I would say yes right so i think we're done i want to thank you all for tuning in and uh, i shall see you uh, next week for another time tunnel Hello, Earthlings. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another vegan time tunnel uh, in a slightly different uh, arrangement, but uh, it's basically the same. So uh, we're building up an archive um, of uh, his historical things in the vegan stroke uh, animal rights, stroke animal liberation uh, movement. So that's what we're, we're at. Uh, today, we've got another one of our founding mothers or one of the strong female pioneers of the vegan social movement so this is a a nice uh, gentle time to roll but it's an it's a nice um story too um also in terms of time we're not going very far today we, i mean we're kind of hovering around the early 40s but really in terms of the focus of this it's it's basically three years 46 47 and 48 and in particular 47 so that's kind of where we're at so indeed welcome to another time to yes the female pioneers they need their voice amplifying in the sense that We've got that usual demographic graphic thing in the movement to point out in the sense that there's always been more women than men, and yet um, the more famous people in the movement tended to be uh, men, whether it's uh, speakers or organizers or um, writers, those those kind of things. But um, we're, we're in the business of changing that, at least as much as we can. In terms of the vegan social movement, there are quite a lot of of women who were very influential in the early years of the vegan social movement and that means the formation of um, the vegan society so this is faye henderson oh, i need my eyes for this now uh it's faye keeling henderson that's her full name so that's where the k uh, comes from and as i said 1947 uh, seems to be um, a big year for her really and um, the first thing I'm going to show you, it's not easy to read, actually, but this is um, Donald Watson's President's Log in the uh, little bit Star Trek. It's the President's Log, star date. Um, this is um, The Vegan, Volume 3, number one, from spring 1947. And Watson is essentially thanking the Hendersons, so that's Faye and also G. Uh, uh, Allen Henderson, uh, for stepping in and um, taking some of the burden from his sh shoulders, essentially, uh, because, well, it's funny, you know, I've often I've often described the beginning of the vegan social movement as a bit chaotic. I think I might change that now, because when you think about it, they did remarkably well in the sense that they didn't even know that they were going to be running a social movement. And so we've got that story about they applied to be a branch or a a section of the vegetarians so we're going to revisit that a little bit because um faye henderson had something to say um about that now just as a side note too you might remember that i've mentioned that uh, when they were searching for the name that eventually became vegan there were some weird and wonderful names that were suggested like dairy bands there's also all vegan and all vega suggested and it was the 
Henderson's apparently who suggested um, those uh, two words. And it seems, according to the historians of the movement, that this is the reason why. I'm going to put this on full screen to give you a better chance of seeing it. The um, the picture on the right looks very almost like modern picture, I think. But um, this is the Vega Vegetarian Restaurant, and it's off Pall Mall in London. So the left one is an advert for it, and the right one is a bit of an advert, but also a photograph. By all accounts, this was very popular. There's a really interesting story about this restaurant. And again, this is, this is we think, where they got the name Vega, which ended up being vegan. And so it was started by some Germans, Walter and Jenny Fleisch, their names, and they'd escaped from Germany because Walter found out, apparently, that he was number 17 on the Gestapo hit list. Now, I'm not quite sure why uh, that was, but it seemed to be the case. And so they fled to uh, from Germany. Um, I think they were interned for a while. And then they ended up running a vegetarian restaurant, as you do, you know, kind of escape the Nazis, get a uh, interned, and then you open a veggie restaurant. It's just a, co a common way of doing it, I, I know. Anyway, um, Faye Henderson was much more visible, really, in the vegan movement than someone like, say, Dorothy Watson uh, on Dorothy Morgan, who became Dorothy Watson. For example, Faye, she wrote a lot of literature for the Vegan Society. She served as their vice president. She toured Britain and Ireland giving lectures and cookery demonstrations. And in fact, um, Scotland, too, as we'll come on. Uh, to see. So this really is just like an advert really for the uh, cookery uh, class that she did. And, and she did this basically from a home in Cumbria, uh, which is by the English Lake District. So we're talking about northeast. Um, so it's above Liverpool, if, if you can picture that. So this is an advert for a special course. And that took place over two weeks. And it included things like lectures, and demos, uh, practical demonstrations, uh, discussions, and garden advice. That was all included. And so essentially what people would do is they would go and have their holidays with them and then also do a vegan-related uh, course. So that actually sounds pretty great, you know. So um, there. The Lazis uh, must not have been happy with, <laughs> with the veggie restaurant. Well... Presumably, they didn't know much about it. So um, well, let's hope not anyway. <laughs> uh, and the uh, the least we say about Nazis and vegetarianism, the, the better, because you know what the anti-vegans anti say, say about that. She also wrote a cookery book. Um, in fact, she wrote a, a couple, I think. But this is uh, Vegan Recipes. This is from 1946. Now, this is interesting as well because of the war. There was a problem getting it printed. Um, so it had a very short print run because of the lack of paper uh, due to the, to the war. So that's another kind of interesting knock on. In fact, it's really interesting because um, some people have kind of said to me on TikTok and places like that, oh, well, you know, your, your movement has been going, going for a long time and it hasn't done much. And I have to point out that, yeah, but it, it was created during a global conflict. And then there was all rationing. And then there was lots of rationing afterwards. And fully, I don't think in Britain, the rationing really finished until the 1960s. So it's not as though it was easy to do in, in the first place. So even things like getting literature together and putting a book together in particular uh, was difficult. But this was one that Faye did in uh, 46, as I said. Now, sociologist Matthew Cole, he's part of that uh, Donald Watson archive that I've mentioned. He suggests that Faye Henderson was a prime mover in pioneering what he called a consciousness raising model for vegan activism. In other words, he puts the emphasis um, on education, at least that's what she did. And to that end in 1947, and clearly understanding the idea of the vegan curious, uh, she wrote this, really interesting. It is our duty to recognize the obligation we owe to these creatures and to understand all that is involved in the consumption and use of their live and dead products. Only thus shall we be properly equipped to decide our own attitude to the question and explain the case 
to others who may be interested, but who have not given the matter serious thought. So that's an interesting quote, and, and it actually informs her general view um, about the relationship between vegans and vegetarians. We'll, we'll, we'll see that um, as we go along. But um, she was in particular very interested in maintaining vegan relations with uh, the vegetarians. And we're going to come back to that story about, you know, the, the, the split or the, you know, the kind of decision, if you like. So here she is writing in 1947, but she's writing in the vegetarian. So again, there was this, this link, you know, she maintained uh, contact with the vegetarian uh, community. And so she ended up um, in the uh, magazines and, and documents, essentially. And she wrote, uh, it seems a colossal presumption that mankind, product of their time, obviously, should have interfered so tremendously in the life and liberty of the harmless creatures of the earth. But the result is indeed a sorry one. Directly due to men's exploitation, the animals have become both dependent and disease ridden, while man himself has drifted far from the happiness of healthy simplicity. So there's echoes there of the kind of thing that Watson would say, the kind of things that Cross would say. And then, Speaking of humans, she said, um, he has become physically diseased, morally depraved, and spiritually uh, degraded, which is a heck of a, a list of things to go wrong for humanity. But again, that goes back to the, to the largeness of the Vegan Pioneers project, in, in the sense that they saw that happening, they'd seen those world wars, they were shattered by it. Um, and and then they thought, okay, we need to get, you know, we need to get uh, out of this. How do we do that? Uh, veganism, so animal liberation, human liberation, all tied up together. That's that's how uh, we get out of it essentially. This is going back now to the winter um, edition of the Vegetarian, still 1947. Uh, man will not no, uh, interfere knowingly with the lives of others. This is describing the vegan world really he will not kill or eat or drink nor for clothing but will find other more natural ways of feeding and protecting himself commentary from Ruja in the background you'll have to wait i'm afraid Ruj. um he will not exploit neither man or beast but strive to live harmoniously from day to day so this was an article entitled vegan values and then if you look at the back issues of the vegan uh, booklet uh, or magazine, you'll see that that in itself became a booklet. I think it was expanded to something like 19 pages. It was available through the Vegan Society for the princely sum of six old pence, um, which used to be called a tanner in those days. I think it's probably worth about half a half a cent or half a, you know, what, what yeah, you say cent in in North America and Canada, don't you send in Australia? So a kind of euro cent, half a euro cent perhaps. So the article ends with this. It is hoped that any group of people with vegan sympathies in this or any other country will communicate with the vegan society here with a view to cooperating in the widest possible application of vegan principles. The forming of a vegan international movement will operate for peace and prosperity throughout the universe. So very Star Trek, uh, not just uh, restricted to, to planet Earth, which was quite good. Uh, yeah, you, you really don't like this, do you? Don't, you don't like this time tunnel at all. Getting a real bad commentary here from, from Ruja. So um, as I said before, then Henderson in particular seemed very concerned with keeping the contacts within the vegetarian um, community. And she also has got her own version. I'm not going to read this out for you, but essentially this is where she tells the story of the vegans attempting to create a non-vegan section of the vegetarian society. She seemed more upset and disappointed than most um, that the vegetarians had basically rejected uh, the vegans. And um, she hints that... Um, in, in her account of it, she hints that the vegetarians saw veganism as extreme 
And that was one of the reasons why they didn't really want this non-dairy section. And so it's interesting how, you know, you get some kind of moderate accounts, if you like, or some accounts where it just says, well, they were keen for the vegans to just do their own thing, man type of thing. Whereas, um, you know, Henderson is saying that, no, they, they, didn't, they didn't like where veganism was going and they didn't really want the vegetarians to be associated with it. So that was quite interesting. And so um, Henderson said that the Vegetarian Society decision uh, was appealed. And, um, and so she says that the uh, Vegetarian Society decision to cut ties with the soon to be vegans uh, was appealed, but to no avail, she said. And she also said that individual approaches were also ma made to the vegetarians. And they also said, kept saying no. And so that's the story that we've learned already that the vegan social movement gets up and running and a bit chaotically, as I've said, but understandably so, uh, in 1944, uh, with Watson's first bulletin uh, published in November of uh, that year. And of course, the interesting thing about that is that uh, November bec becomes World Vegan Month um, in the 1990s and November the 1st being uh, World Vegan Day as well. So moving on to 1948, this is the edition of The Vegan now. Anderson wrote an ominous piece entitled You Have Been Warned. Um, now, one interesting thing about this, I'm gonna put it on full screen for you because again, Matthew Cole, the sociologist, has pointed out, or he made something of the subtitle advocating living without exploitation they had that subtitle for quite a long time and again it kind of if you like uh, indicates their kind of what you might call controversially a pro-intersectional uh, approach because it kind of echoed watson's idea that veganism was about the uh, opposition to the exploitation of sentient life so cole mentions that in one of his articles about the vegan society now in her article Faye Henderson was responding to dire warnings emanating from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations on the food problem, which can be summarized with this dramatic line, the whole human race is rumbling to destruction. So again, you can't get more kind of dramatic uh, than that. She talks uh, in the article about food security issues. She talks about the transfer of feed uh, for so-called livestock, rather than providing food directly for humans, which again is a very kind of modern sounding kind of thing that, you know, we take away um, food from those without food, those humans without food, because, you know, it's the usual thing about there's going to be many thousands of, of humans uh, without food this evening, but there won't be many farmed animals without food at all. So that's usually the thing. It's not that we don't have the food to feed them. It's just that we prefer to give it to livestock. So, so called. OK, Rouge. <laughs> OK, and then she says the solution to this problem lies in the homes of the people, as in the organization of governments. Now, this is a really interesting thing when you think about when it when it was said. I mean, we talk, we talk about 1948. This is almost like a commentary on something like Extinction Rebellion, you know, this kind of idea that it's all about this kind of, um, you know, kind of system change. She's basically saying you, you really need you really need bo both to occur. And um, I think a lot of people would um, would agree with that, you know. So the, um, the problem lies in our homes in terms of our choices and our consuming and that kind of stuff as well as in the kind of larger kind of structures of society. A crucial part of the solution to the food problem from a vegan point of view is to eliminate what was then called dairy and stock farming. <clears throat> and um, Henderson declares that as unnecessary, extravagant and cruel. And here she turns to a concern of many of the vegan movement pioneers which was the state of the soil um, involving the art of cultivating the soil. And she concludes by saying that um, give and take is a good rule in all phases of life. And it especially applies to our relationship 
with the soil. So Faye Henderson was an admirer of a botanist called Albert Howard, and he was a pioneer of organic uh, gardening. So this is he. I'll put that again on, on full screen for you to have a quick look at. She had traveled to meet him, actually, in his wartime home and paid tribute to him in the pages of the vegan magazine after his death. And she was particularly impressed by the fact that he said that uh, food needs to be grown in healthy, naturally balanced soil. So it's really interesting, this kind of concern about the soil, which was a common, common theme amongst the vegan movement pioneers. Dr. Samantha Calvert, the head of communications at the Vegan Society, reports that the society had turned its attention to the practicalities of bringing about a vegan world as early as 1947. So we're only three years in and already they're starting to think big, uh, if you like. That would then uh, mean the growth of what we now know as vegan philosophy, but it also meant that they were starting to think in terms of, um, you know, how can we how can we help people who maybe want to um, join us? But also, and this is a very kind of early version of this, they were interested in farmers who wanted to transition. So um, this sheet is from... Uh, an article called Ripened by Human Determination. It's part of the history of the movement section of the Vegan Society website. And um, this is really interesting. He says, um, the War Agricultural Executive Committee, WAEC, seemed to have an iron grip on farming in the post-war years. And in particular, they could con uh, take control of any farms that they deemed to be inefficient. So again, this is all part of the kind of post-war um, kind of situation. The once held passion for gardening of the, yeah, well, interesting. There are still some people with organic uh, allotments. I, I know a couple of people, but um, they're not influencers, <laughs> shall we say that? They, they're of, of an older generation. So we've got the case of Mrs. M. W. Austin Goodman, and she is a Welsh farmer and runs her own farm in Wales. And she contacted the vegan mag. And Faye was the editor at the time. So Austin Goodman was a vegetarian farmer. And she was running a farm that produced oats, wheat and dairy. Uh, but she wanted to get rid of the dairy because she was thinking strongly about, about vegan ethics and everything. The problem was, and going back to this government thing that could just close her down at a minute's notice, is that the dairy element of the farm was the most profitable. And so she then uh, had a problem. Uh, she began to take veganism seriously, as I said, but she was almost like financially couldn't kind of do it. So how could she keep her farm and eliminate her main source of income on moral grounds? And so Henderson, as far back as 1947, said that the vegan society needs to work out something for farmers such as this in order that they can help such people. You know, she, talk, she talked about bringing about a workable scheme that could help farmers such as this one. Now, sadly, I don't know the, the end of the story about whether they were able to help her, the farmer, or not. Uh, but they were aware that they probably needed to, uh, to that extent. So that was quite, quite a good thing. I hear people daily tell farmers to stop farming. The 1% uh, of those people who offer solutions or assistance to make any transition is a fraction. And mostly is down to lack of info. Yeah, well, it's, it's the one form really of political fo uh, campaigning that I think is possibly worthwhile. Uh, and even now, in the sense that, um, uh, you know, we've, we've got to, I mean, first of all, <laughs> I think the, the first job about um, helping um, farmers uh, transition is to understand the subsidy system. And as far as I know, the subsidy system is like economics. It's very difficult to actually understand what it's all about. 
and you know where you're you're posting from there, Andy. The, the in Britain, well, obviously Brexit is going to cause extra difficulties for you. Where I am in Dublin, we're still part of the European Community, so that would mean that we would need to understand how the subsidy system works on a European-wide uh, level and see what kind of what kind of pressure could be brought in order to help farmers, you know, because as we know from our TikTok discussions, the real problem for a lot of farmers is the startup costs, thinking about the startup costs. I mean, they're, they're, they're looking at their dairy farm, as it were, and probably thinking, wow, you know, if I was to strip all that away and start again, look how much that would cost. And then they think, well, okay, well, if I go for vertical farming, well, again, I'd, I'd have a whole new startup cost uh, problem. And so that's where the subsidy is going to have to play a, a role. So Henderson uh, did quite a few talks, as I mentioned. She did cookery demonstrations in Edinburgh, and she did talks in Dublin and Belfast. Uh, she did say, actually, that the, or at least it's reported, that the, um, the, the Dublin one was well attended. The Irish were a little bit behind in terms of their understanding of veganism. That they were um, that they they were uh, kind of attentive and uh, a good audience, as it were. And again, what tended to happen is that when she did these talks, she would do it through the vegetarian societies or the regional ones or the local ones. So once once again, you um, you know you get uh, you get this thing that she needed to, to to remain in contact with the with the vegetarians. Um, I've got a note here. One, this is the the vegan Q and A. I don't know what that means. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, let me just see if there's a slide that I'm not understanding. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, she also ran this thing called Po Pure in um in the vegan, and people basically kind of um write in saying, well, you know, um. I can't get this, so what do you think? And you know, can, can I get a, a vegan version of that and all this kind of stuff? And it's interesting here, you do see a generational difference here because the the it wasn't, you know, in those days it wasn't the way it is now where you can virtually replicate anything uh, that you like. And essentially she kind of says, um, so it's a little bit like uh, the uh, the lyrics of that Rolling Stones song, you can't always get what you want. And she was basically saying, look, you will never be able to have fluffy cakes like the non-vegans. It's just a fact of life. And so we, we have to put up with it kind of thing. And, and so in those days, a lot of people were asking, but the answer to it was, well, at this time, it can't be done. So again, for modern day vegans watching this, things are pretty different now and much better in that sense. Um, so that's... Um, that's a kind of good final lesson to take from from this, in the sense that it just goes to show how things have moved, if only on the dietary side of, of things. Right. So, uh, as promised, this was a relatively short uh, time tunnel. So that was the second of our powerful women. Let me just have a quick look at the some of the comments. There's also tons of money within the movement. Well, yeah, that's interesting. It could be used like loans. Yeah, we bid. Yep, yeah, that that's right. Yep, yeah, that is that is a very good point in the sense that um, when you think about the duplication that goes on in this movement, and you think where it could go, I mean, um, how many how many vertical farms can be could be set up with a million pounds that allegedly we can give to the Pope? Um, so um, that would um, that would be an interesting thing to to actually. I mean, you almost like need to do. A financial audit of this movement because there is a lot of waste and there has been for a long time. I became aware of that when I was um, a committee member of one of the national groups down in London and I suddenly realized that at the time I think there was five different, this is just Britain, five different anti-view section organizations and then that was added to by other ones like Uncaged and so in that sense. Uh, like Peter, for example, they could pay for thousands of farms to transition. Yeah, that, that, well, that is true. Uh, two, uh, not to mention that Peter have actually just got a lot of money just sat there, as it were, doing nothing as well. So, yeah, 
um, it, it would be a really interesting use of thinking about the movement's money in, in the practicalities of, you know, really helping other animals. And if you could help farmers to move away from committing rights violations on other animals and farming in the vegan way, then th there's not much better than that, right? And so given the fact that there is a lot of money slushing around in the movement, and given the fact that there's a lot of duplication that goes on, then you would have thought that if we really want to move this movement on, then you know some kind of um, some kind of scrutiny of where the money is, what is it being used for, what what is the justification for all the duplication, and I've never really been able to see any. Certainly not now in the internet age. There used to be certain ad, um, arguments that you could have about the reason why you would need you know some power bases dotted around the country, as it were. But in the age of the internet, those those arguments are not very good. Hi, Deb. Uh, the F, uh, the AFA Agricultural Fairness Alliance here in the USA is assisting in transitioning farmers. I wonder whether Howard, um, you know, um, my friend, <laughs> I forgot his name. Oh no. <laughs> uh, it, you know, so that you know, we're talking about farm kind. So uh, yeah, Harold Brown. Sorry, sorry, Harold. If you ever get to watch this, I do apologize for forgetting your name. Um, but um, I mean, he he's been doing that for. 25 years helping uh, farmers, helping with things like the paperwork, helping get through all the kind of bureaucracy of government, uh, you know, kind of selling selling one thing and buying another, all, all those kind of things. So th those are really kind of practical things that the vegan movement could do. And as we've seen from this time tunnel, that impulse goes all the way back to 1948. So it's amazing, really, that the vegans were already thinking about it you know, that long ago. And, you know, our movement obviously is much richer now, you know. Uh, do the vegans say help all countries or only in the in Britain? I don't I don't know the question to that. I, I don't know whether they um, that they used to be. The vegan site used to be, funny enough, a member of the International Vegetarian Union. But I'm not even sure that exists anymore, and also uh, whether they would still be in it if, if it did. I, I I can't really answer that question. Uh, but yeah, I mean we've got a globalized problem. We need a globalized movement, which allegedly we have. We the the money in the movement is globalized. There's plenty of it, so it would be an interesting project to kind of go. Okay, let's move on to the practicalities of helping the farmers. And I suppose one thing on the psychological level there is that we've got to see stop seeing farmers as just the enemy in this in the sense that it's not as though we're going to fire all the farmers and hire new farmers in their place what we're looking for is is what some of them are doing now which is going i made a mistake don't want to do this anymore and i'd like to transition but it's the same people you know three years ago they were running a dairy farm now now they've got a veganic farm so it's the same people. So it's not as though we should demonize them uh, in that sense. So there you go. Right, people. So um, I think we're just about done. So I shall say thank you for tuning in. Um, if you know anybody who's interested in the history of the movement, then do um, point them towards my YouTube channel and in particular the uh, playlist, uh, Rogers Vegan, I think it's called Vegan Time Channel or Rogers Vegan Time Channel. So people, take care and I'll see you uh, next week. Earthlings, earthlings of the world, uh, and where else? So, um, welcome to another vegan time tunnel uh, with me, Roger Yates, and uh, a noisy cat <laughs> at the moment. So we'll see how that uh, transpires. So we're um, 
We're putting together an archive, as people uh, who are regular will know, of uh, significant events and people in the history of the animal rights movement, the vegan movement, etc., cetera, um, et cetera. There's been a particular emphasis uh, at times with the pioneers of the vegan social movement, and so that's where we're at again today. So that's a, a good thing. Now, let me remind um, everyone that... Um, that feel free to comment. Um, we don't charge you to comment um, in terms of getting your your views on screen. So feel free uh, to do that. And if you tune in from anywhere else besides YouTube, you'll find that the best chat is on YouTube if you so wish to uh, take part in it. Um, yes. I'm going to have cat issues today, I'm sure, but we, we shall see. Um, <laughs> okay, so people, uh, welcome to the Vegan Time Tunnel. Well, that bit worked. There's been a bit of a glitch in the uh, in the system um, for a little while, but that. Uh, Seems to be okay. So, yes, yeah, so Leslie Cross. Now, the first thing to say about um, Leslie Cross is that we're going to be going through work that was published uh, in the very late 1940s into the early to mid 1950s. So, the language is an issue. Um, so, as usual, I tend to think that, you know, we all really know that um, people are a product of their time. And so, I tend not to kind of correct it. And so, you will get man for humanity and so forth. So if that rankles a little bit, apologies for that, but um, it is the way that they spoke in those days. So um, that's just the way it is uh, in a way. Right, uh, now I tend to say, and you know, people who know me uh, will know this, that um, I think Leslie Cross is one of the most significant figures in the earliest history of the vegan social movement. Now, obviously, um, Donald Watson is the best known of the co-founders of the social movement, but uh, Leslie Cross had a profound effect, uh, not least on um, on the development of the philosophy, as, as we'll see. I just want to make another caveat, really, which is the fact that when I talk about the vegan social movement, I'm not saying that these are the people who were the first at anything, really, except the fact that they came together and they put together a cause um a social movement and a social movement organization and they called it um veganism so there you are so th that's so that's the that's the issue I, I i'm i'm never claiming that these were the first uh, anything really apart from coming together to form um a social movement um now one thing that uh, cross did was he pointed out in 1949 and we'll come through to this, that the Vegan Society, um, the social movement organization, did not have a definition of veganism. It did have a de definition of the vegan diet at this stage, but he set about working on vegan philosophy in a whole series of essays uh, in the vegan magazine. So we're talking about pre-internet here. We're talking about the 1940s and 50s. So it was a very slow process. Um, in some senses, um, they did a lot of kind of thinking aloud uh, in the pages of their journal, The Vegan. And so it's the kind of thinking aloud from Cross uh, and his work on the philosophy of veganism that, that this time tunnel's um, all about. There's an irony, really, because all those um, essays are now available on the Internet, <laughs> which is a bit of an irony. Um, so if you w want to see them, and in fact... Uh, you know, look at uh, where I'm getting the material for today from, then if you went to this, the uh, Candid Hominid, uh, you'll see all the, the Leslie Cross uh, materials. Now, today, I'm going to go through in some detail the search for veganism one and two, as you can see there, and then also the search for freedom. So those are the, those are the areas that I'm, I'm picking out. But as you can see, there are other materials um, apart uh, from that. Now, one thing which is interesting, some historians or some some websites, at least, will say that there was a bit of um, a problem between Donald Watson and 
uh, Leslie Cross in the sense of uh, some form of rivalry. And so, um, you know, that may or may not be true. But one thing that is certain, really, is that whenever Watson talked about Cross publicly, he, he was full of compliments. He was very warm uh, about him, really. And here Watson is saying, I hesitate to single out anyone, but I would say Leslie Cross and Arthur Ling must be put in the records as being the two outstanding faithful contributors to our cause. And then again, it was certainly one of the outstanding people who have served the movement. And in retirement, he went up and down the country giving his lecture, The Milk of Human Kindness, all voluntary, of course, paying his own uh, expenses. So that's Watson talking about um, Cross. Um, now, those two um, quotes really allude to the fact that Watson was, um, that Cross, um, sorry, was also a pioneer in terms of bringing about um, plant milks and formation of Plamil, um, which is still which is still ongoing. And so he, um, he references Arthur Ling. And so Cross and Ling were prime movers in bringing about uh, plant milks into Britain, at least, you know, the first kind of commercially available ones, uh, this kind of stuff. So um, although that's quite important in the history of our movement, th this is not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to concentrate on his philosophical uh, work, um, really. So um, if you there, there are there are some um, accounts of uh, the development and history of Planel that you can find, but uh, I won't be going through that uh, today. Now, Elsie Shrigley, who was um, a subject of a time tunnel uh, before, um, she was writing in The Vegan and covering the first decade here, so 44 through to 54. And um, she would certainly agree that Cross was a very significant figure uh, in the history of um, the movement. So she says here, the Vegan Society was 10 years old in November uh, 1954. Thus, it is now appropriate time to look back and assess its achievements and to remember the personalities who have helped its evolution. There have been non-dairy vegetarians through the centuries, for example, Socrates, but a letter written by Mr. Leslie Cross in The Vegetarian Messenger, pointing out the ethics of non-dairy vegetarianism and the correspondent that followed uh, during 1943, roused the conscience of some lacto-vegetarians and led to the formation of the vegan society. So one of the time tunnels uh, covers all of that in great detail um, because non-dairy vegetarians have been asking questions um, for a long time, uh, not least from say the beginning of uh, the 20th century, um, interrupted by uh, the First World War really. But I think what Shrigley is getting at here is that um, Leslie Cross's correspondence in the vegetarian message was the kind of final thing really that pushed um, the formation of the vegan society you know it was kind of like a, you know rumbling under as an issue uh, for a lot of people so that's what one of the um, the things about that and also another issue is of course the fact that we had this refusal from the vegetarian society to include a non-dairy section in their organization and of course, um, I've always called that a great favor that the vegetarians did for the vegans in the sense that they essentially said, um, well, look, let's just, uh, you know, you, you, go, you go ahead and do your vegan stuff and we'll carry on doing vegetarianism. And so that's what happened. And that really is the reason now we have vegan philosophy um, as we know it. And so in that sense, it was a great um, success. So here's a little summary of what some of the things that I've said um, so far, which is this is um, Sam Calvert, the head of communications for the Vegan Society, and um, sometime uh, I think either classified as the official historian or an unofficial historian, but she she did work on the history of the vegan movement, not least this document here, which is called "Ripened by Human Determination: Seventy Years." of the Vegan Society, and that's still online. If you go to the, the Vegan Society's website and look at the history section, you'll find 
a long uh, document. And in that, um, uh, Sam Calvert says, although the vegan diet was def uh, defined early on, it was as late as 1949 before Leslie J. Cross pointed out that the society lacked a definition of veganism. And he suggested, quote, the principle of the emancipation of animals from exploitation by man. This was later clarified uh, as to seek an end to the use of animals by man for food, commodities, work, hunting, vivisection, and all other uses involving exploitation of animal life by man. So th those were some of the early attempts. So we're gonna go through that uh, in a little bit um, of detail uh, in, in a sense. So um, we start then with this um, in search of veganism, and this is kind of part one uh, for now. And um, this is summer 1949. And um, this, this is actually quite a modern thing to say in the sense that there are um, even websites now kind of focused on the, the definition, basically saying that everybody seems to have their own uh, def definition of veganism, but, but that that wasn't an ideal situation, certainly not at the beginning of the social movement. So Cross says, when we say veganism is this or that, what we are really saying is my idea of veganism is this or that. For there is nothing in the constitution of the vegan society which states what veganism is. And so um, this is the first thing that that Cross points out and says, right, we've, we've got an issue that we need to kind of sort out, um, if you like. And so we're kind of five years in to the existence of the vegan social movement um, at this stage. And um, Cross actually said that there was good organizational reasons to delay the formalization of an official definition. So not having a definition uh, thus far, as it were, wasn't a problem. In fact, it was probably a good thing, he, he argued. He said, but the time when it was a benefit compared with the time when it's a hindrance it is, com is coming to you know fruition now. And so we, we, we've got to, as it were, start working on, on the definition of veganism rather than just a vegan diet. And he says, we're going to have to start doing it pretty soon. And that essentially is what he did uh, from that point on. So up until at least 1954, Cross engages in an exercise of, as I said, he's basically thinking out loud through the pages of The Vegan, uh, the magazine, and evolving ideas about vegan philosophy uh, as the years ticked by, uh, in a sense. Now, this is an interesting one. This essentially is almost like uh, Cross providing a, a literature review of what's been done up to that date in terms of thoughts about ideas about um, a definition. And um, so this is kind of definitional work that has been done up to 1949. But he said that um, there hasn't been a great deal of it, but there was some. And he said it even in the, the editorial of the very first Vegan News, before it was called The Vegan, stated, we can see quite plainly that our present civilization is built upon the exploitation of, of animals, just as past civilizations were built on the exploitation of slaves. I think it's worth pointing out, uh, just for modern times, really, um, in terms of the language here, it's quite interesting in, uh, in the sense that they talked about exploitation. And I know we've got exploitation of and cruelty to in the now official definition, but they didn't really go for that very much uh, in those days. Uh, Kate J, Billy Thompson, who runs the Retreat Sanctuary, tells a lovely story about a chance encounter with Arthur Ling, who he met on a flight when they both uh, realized each other were asking for soya milk. Right, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. In fact, I've got, um, I've got a time tunnel uh, about uh, Arthur Ling, but um, it's not published yet, I don't think. The interesting thing about uh, that, that point, though, is the fact that um, one of the first things that they did as Plamil was to provide these little, those little diddy little cartons that you got on planes, you know, with, with, with like the, you know, the peel top kind of thing. Um, and I, I remember those, I used to go to, um, there's that famous uh, village in Wales, uh, Clamfair PG, but it's, 
it's that really long one which finishes go go gok you know i, I i'm not even going to attempt to try and say the name but there's like a visitor center there and there used to be some plamil um little cartons of milks uh, which were a kind of hangover from those kind of days but yeah that, that's one of the first things they did they actually started to look at um at things for airlines which i suppose was quite a modern thing uh, to do so um cross says that uh, this first statement from watson uh, was an early hint that non-dairy vegetarians vegetarianism was destined to be more uh than just part of the general philosophy of a new movement. Um, and so uh, they started off as non-dairy vegetarians and they quickly moved on, uh, essentially. By the time we get to the third issue, which is May 1945, states that veganism was the practice of living upon uh, fruits, nuts, vegetables, grains, and other wholesome non-animal foods. And cross comments in the brackets. It would perhaps have been more accurate to have said not that veganism is, but that it involves living on such uh, foods. And then he mentions the fourth issue, which is um, close to my heart in the sense that I still think this is probably the best statement about uh, uh, veganism that's ever been, really. The object of the vegan society is to oppose the exploitation of sentient life uh, whether it is profitable to do so or not. And uh, Cross again comments, uh, this is a considerable widening of the original non-dairy uh, motivation. And so right from the start, when they were, as it were, given their head by the vegetarians in this kind of ironic kind of way that it worked, um, they started moving away from uh, just thinking about food, moving away from just non-dairy vegetarianism, and they started to think about uh, other issues, um, which culminated with, in Cross's own work, uh, really. So this is essentially him going through the work and the thoughts of Donald Watson, uh, and that's before Cross takes on the work of um, evolving and describing vegan philosophy. Uh, Cross also notes that even when in March 1947, uh, the Vegan Society was formed in a constitutional sense, so it gained a constitution. Um, so even though that meant that they were starting to become more official in terms of being an organization and a social movement organization, there was still no vegan definition that had emerged at that time. So, so we're talking about 47, but still no sign of a vegan uh, definition. He says that, uh, this is an interesting um, observation, he says, essentially, up until then, the people in the vegan society were merely attempting, he says, to make their vegetarianism logical, which is an interesting phrase. Uh, clearly, they needed a new definition, and so this is why the work had begun, um, that new members could consent to, and as it were, were able to kind of, if you like, pledge alliance to, and so this became an urgent kind of need uh, within the, the later part of the first, um, you know, 10 years of the, uh, of the society. Cross believed that the definition needed to be in the form of a principle from which practices logically devolve. Now, th this, is a, this is quite an important point, and we'll see this in detail uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, what veganism should not be seen as is it's not in the form of a set of practices. That's not what veganism is or even aims. It's a principle. He said that they had embarked on a voyage of discovery to find the principle that is veganism. Uh, and it's not a set of practices or aims. So this is how... Um, Cross starts the second part of this essay. So this is In Search of Veganism uh, 2. So this is autumn now of 49. And he says, this is an attempt to discover the principle whose label is veganism. And to suggest a tentative form of words, which as a short definition, closely describes it. Now, that becomes quite important in this story. But we'll leave that for now. But the short definition. 
It should be held in mind that the views expressed are of the writers. So Cross was saying, this is this is me talking, as it were, and this is not official uh, vegan society uh, stuff, as it were. So talking about the um, the process the movement had gone through to date, Cross said that there had been an early tendency to get at the roots of the relationship between man, humanity, and uh, the animals, the other animals. Uh, but to deal with um, a cause rather than almost uncountable symptoms. So this is important. He said, there is no evidence that veganism was fundamentally concerned with anything other than the man plus animal relationship. And the end section uh, here, this is Cross's emphasis. And um, I've, I've kind of picked out concerned with anything other than. So this might suggest, as some people have suggested it is true and kind of hope for that that cross is a kind of animals only theorist but that that is not the case the key wording here is fundamentally concerned and in the very next sentence he says that that relationship is veganism's paramount but not only concern so cross suggests that existing literature from watson uh, reinforces uh, that view that just expressed. And he says this, for example, he cites an address on veganism by Watson in 1947. He said, this contains phrases such as the, the right approach to the problem of animal emancipation to be the true emancipators of animals. The vegan renounces the superstition that continuing human existence depends on the exploitation of these creatures. And the time has come for us to, uh, for us boldly to renounce the idea that we have the right to exploit um, animals. And um, at the end of the paragraph, Cross writes this, the thread that runs through the literature on this point is a conviction that for the sake of both man and his fellow creatures, the animals must one day be freed from his exploitation. So this becomes a major theme for Cross and some of the early pioneers. And essentially, you could boil it down to something like our liberation is their liberation, their liberation uh, is our liberation. So it's my contention that what we're seeing is the very first rehearsals of something that I've called the focus and the scope um, of veganism here. And so I'm going to try and put, um, excuse the phrase, try and put a bit of flesh on, on that uh, now in a sense. So Cross starts talking about what he calls observations. He said there are a number of observations that lead to the following. He said that veganism is a reform. The first observation, the impelling element, which means the driving or the urge is compassion for other animals arising out of the treatment uh, meted out to them by humanity. Its fundamental concern is with the meeting point between the world of man, as he put it, and the world of the animals. Its existing presupposition, uh, presupposes, sorry, uh, maladjustment at that point. So veganism, it's, it's the, the existence of veganism presupposes a maladjustment uh, at, the at the point where we and other animals relate, if you like. Its purpose must be corrective to that maladjustment. And the maladjustment is intimately connected to man's use of animals, more, precise, more precisely with his ha habit of acting as a parasite on living creatures who cannot successfully resist his will. So, Cross argues that any definition of veganism must contain those six observations and also violate none of them. And that a, a form of words which meets the re requirements is that veganism is the principle 
of the ob ab abolition, abolition of the exploitation of animals by man. And the positive aspect of this negative in the word non um, exploitation approach is the granting of freedom, uh, or he said in one word, emancipation. So moving towards the beginning of you know, the foundation of the definition, veganism may therefore be defined as the principle of the emancipation of the animals from exploitation by man. And Cross provides some footnotes here. He says that emancipation means the state of being set free, exploitation, the act of using for selfish purposes, and animals, sentient animate creatures other than man. But there's more uh, from that, uh, maladjustment. Um, hi, Colleen. Well, animal, yeah, broken relationship. I suppose it, it is actually. Um, that probably <coughs> is a fair point that um, animal rising are, are getting at that, that idea that we've got a broken relationship. Yeah, I think that's probably true. So there's more than just that. So this is this is a starting point. So we we've got all those observations. Then that gets boiled down to this, and then it expands back out again. So it's kind of quite interesting. Cross says that this definition meets those six observations, but that in itself is not enough. They must also meet the requirements of what he calls wisdom and logic. And he says that they must be measured against the general philosophical argument. And so he then comes up with this and apologies because for some reason this hasn't come out completely uh, fully. This is the only slide that I've got a problem with. He said, the broad demand which wisdom makes upon a man is that he shall free himself of the change, uh, chains which bind him to his less noble desires and inhibit his ascent to higher standpoints, um, wider visions and consequent happiness. There are a number of tests by which his efforts to free himself may be judged and one of the most stringent is his conduct towards those over whom he has power. So this is not really uh, unique to Cross, but it, it, you know it's him putting this in a, in a vegan context. It is applied um, in acute form uh, at the point where his world meets the world of the animals uh, for uh, over whom he, he has dominion. So sorry, that's a bit that's cut off. Um, from the bottom so he says that, okay so this is this is a formulation but then if you look at um he says his conduct you know humanity's conduct at this point in other words the present time reveals tendencies which are strongly self-indulgent at the expense of the creatures there is a widespread failure to understand that other animals have rights relative to relatively equal to his, and th that's Cross's um, emphasis, relatively, yeah, that, that's uh, Cross's um, emphasis. His exploitations result in a needless curtailment of natural freedom over a wide front and inevitably ends in one sort of slaughterhouse or another. And again, that is Cross, Cross's emphasis again. Uh, this is true of all his exploitations from the backyard hen to the great beef and dairy herds. And then it's interesting, um, he seems to go on to address an, an issue which was an issue of the day. He says that um, although some horses may end up in kind of rest homes, uh, he said that that only applies to, to a few. He said most are killed for commodities feeding stuffs or human consumption and again he goes back to worn out cows from the dairy herds uh they're not pensioned off uh, in clover fields and so um he just makes that kind of point which is obviously addressing some issue that was uh, a burning issue of the day now this passage then reveals a theme that cross would fully development in late uh, fully develop in later essays um, 
because both he and Donald Watson expected veganism to do a lot of work for humans as well as for other animals. Watson went on to declare that veganism was the only movement that was capable of safe, saving humanity. And Ross, uh, Cross's work was replete with lines such as, quote, because he would free himself from many of his um, the, the demands made by his lower nature, the benefit of veganism to man himself would be incalculable. So if you look at uh, Cross's work, then that kind of phraseology is used um, all the time. So this really is the beginning of Leslie Cross's thoughts about the moral evolution of humanity. And they would start to argue that um, human beings, uh, and this is probably the result of two global conflicts in short order, have, have kind of hit a new low, which historically I think is arguable, but that's where, where they was. And they thought that we need to evolve morally um, to get ourselves out of some kind of you know moral trough if you like. And, and that, that was summed up uh, quite nicely uh, in the Kathleen Janaway time tunnel, where she, she was saying, you know, you know, ca can we do it? Or, you know, are we capable of, of doing it? And so they, they were all kind of on that kind of same theme, really, uh, that um, they needed, they needed to um, see the moral evolution of humanity. And so he, he writes, because emancipation would at one and the same moment release the animals from bondage and man from being their parasite because of putting it into effect man would free himself from some of the change which bind him to his less noble desires it fulfills the demands of wisdom as well as logic and so he's saying now we're getting um a situation where it's kind of all coming together we've as it were, got a real focus. And then we've also got um, the aspects of the scope uh, which kind of point towards, you know, wider things, um, if you like. Okay, so finally, uh, on this rather detailed rundown of those, of those, of those two first essays, um, uh, there's also another three further striking indications, as he calls them, that this is so. In other words, that this fulfills the demands of wisdom as well as logic. The first two, he says, emerge from a broad view of the general trend of human evolution. A movement to emancipate animals may be seen to be following naturally and historically upon the movement to emancipate human slaves, which is also what Watson said uh, in the very first uh, vegan news. It thus possesses the uh, aesthetic and significant attribute of evolutionary continuity. Second, uh, it is far from being outside the bounds of probability. It's likely, in other words, that uh, a wrong turning has been taken by humanity somewhere in his evolution. And that wrong turning was the enslavement, the so-called domestication, or what Nybert calls the domestication of other animals. And he says this is a proposition abundantly argued by American writer Henry Bailey Stevens. There is a reference to that in the essay if you want to uh, check it. Thirdly, emancipation goes straight to the cancer at the heart of the existing man-animal relationship, and as Colleen is saying, the broken relationship that uh, Animal Rising talk about, and would remove at one stroke the single cause from which all the sorry symptoms arise. There's quite a lot, even right into the 1960s, of claims which, which are very much like this. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of sorry state of the world, and that what we need is is veganism and that almost in terms of um, you know, it's, it's kind of cultural um, promise w w you know would would be a, a really kind of good thing uh, to happen and you know so even beyond people like Watson and Cross people like um, Sanderson um, for example right into the 1960s these kind of phrases were used so 
Now, um, that just really is the, the first two, two essays where he starts to really work on the intricate details of, of vegan philosophy. And so time will allow me to go through each and every essay in that kind of detail. So that's the search for veganism one and two. Uh, but I do want to talk about this one in particular. So this is at the end of this process, 1954. So it deserves some attention um, for that. Um, I think the first thing to say really is that they don't write in sound bites. And so um, this, this kind of idea of, you know, making it kind of available for Twitter is not is not really on with the way that they wrote. They they wrote full scale essays, and in the vegan, you know, we, we, you might have full pages, you know, four pages, uh, to, to comprise one essay, and so, you know, it's it's important for people to 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 get a real um, understanding of their position is to is to read is read all all of what they said, and sometimes um, because it's again not sound bites. You, you might have to read it more than once. Um, I, I certainly have uh, in that sense. Uh, now, the first sentence is very significant. Going back to what was said before about this short definition, he said, this is an attempt to state in simple terms what veganism is and why and how it came into existence and to suggest what it could mean for mankind. Now, now, it's interesting this, because if you think in terms of what I call the focus and scope, usually what they do is they talk about the focus first, and then they talk, talk about the scope. In this essay, which is the last one of this little series, he talks about the scope first. And in some senses, I mean, I don't, I'm not calling it a brave thing to do, but he's certainly not afraid to go for the scope first. And then, of course, he, he then starts talking about the focus. It's just, again, they expected all of their words to be, you know, to be uh, read, really. And so it didn't really matter where they began in terms of focus and scope. So usually it was focus first. On this occasion, it's kind of focus first. Plain speaking is always best on a subject like this. Ah, John. Excellent. I am... Um, Pleased to see you here. So John Cross, for, for people who don't know, and certainly people who might be watching the, the recording, is Leslie Cross's son, has been vegan for 80 years. And uh, so welcome along, John. You're more than welcome uh, here. And so uh, Leslie Cross goes on to say, the word veganism is a symbol that stands for a major change, a new mutation comparable to the freeing of the serfs and the freeing of the slaves. So again, that kind of uh, rehearsal of those kind of points that uh, that was said by Watson in '44 and re repeated by a lot of people right up in, until the 60s, really. And then its official definition, the doctrine that man should live without exploiting animals is accurate, precise, and comprehensive, but not always fully understood. And he goes, this is not surprising. Um, now, I take this to mean that even though they they took all those kind of observations and they boiled it all down to, to this very short definition, which ended up being, you know, nine or ten words, he's basically saying that, you know, that's just the beginning of our adventures into veganism. The definition itself can only be seen as the beginning of, you know, an entry point into understanding uh, veganism, it's certainly not the be end and end all. So he says, this is not surprising um, as it might seem for rarely have nine short words enshrined a reform so massive, the achievement of which would bring a new world and new men to inhabit it. So again, all those kind of themes coming together, but basically trying to suggest really that, um, that even though they've condensed it down, in a sense, you need them to expand it back out again to, to kind of gain a full uh, understanding of, uh, of veganism. 
Okay, so here's a few more thoughts from this essay, The, the Surge of Freedom. As I said, it's in Candive Hominid if you want to read uh, the entire thing. I think what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to put it on full screen so you can probably see it a little bit better. Why do we believe we should live without exploiting animals? To put the question in another form, why was such a doctrine formulated? The final, if not the immediate answer, is a revealing one, for it demonstrates the truth of the claim that veganism is not a mere side shoot in human evolution, but a cent central extending growth of considerable significance. So as you can see, the claims here are very wide ranging and fairly profound. Veganism owes its birth to the fact that at its deepest point within us, we believe impregnably in freedom, particularly perhaps those who were born and bred in these traditionally freedom loving islands. So I, th I think we could probably forgive him for a little bit of jingoism there, but um, we can maybe bracket that out a little bit in the 21st century. Freedom to live our own lives in our way, according to our own inward light, is fundamental to our view of life itself. It is in the light of this concept that we find the true significance of the vegan reform. Only when we see it as a doctrine, not of restriction, as those who oppose it mistakenly believe, and as we all know, they still do, but of freedom. Do we fully comprehend it? And so there's obviously modern day kind of articulations of this kind of idea, you know, kind of, you know, veganism is not a sacrifice, it's a joy, you know, th th those kind of um, ideas. Until the advent of veganism, comparatively few men regarded the animals as being either worthy of or entitled to the right to be free. And probably fewer still realized the impressive effect which the granting of such a right would have upon the freedom of man himself. Now, um, this actually uh, deserves a little bit of um, chat, really, about um, Tom Reagan. This was written before the case for animal rights and probably written before there was a full understanding of the difference between moral rights and, and legal rights. And so what we would see nowadays is that other animals have moral rights. The, the granting of rights, if it's to, to happen, will be legal rights. So that's kind of worth uh, pointing out, just, just for the fact that it's kind of like not Leslie Cross's fault that, you know, he's right. He's right in this, you know, decades before um, Tom Reagan. And so it's just a, a, an interesting thing to point out. When veganism reaches such a stage, there will be a, an immense change of heart and mind in the majority of men and women. The idea of exploiting animals will be as repugnant then as the idea of human slavery is today. Now, this is where, and he's done this in, a, in maybe two, maybe even three different essays. He talks about the obvious and the not so obvious. So... I've always said in terms of focus of scope that the obvious things are related to the focus of veganism and the not so obvious things are related to the scope of veganism. So some of the changes in daily living are obvious and some of this is really kind of modern sounding. There will, for example, be no butcher's shops and the milkman, the milkman, if he still goes his rounds, will be delivering vegan milk, which of course um, he had an involvement in. The countryside will not be heavy with the anguish of cows crying for their calves. That sounds a very modern claim. There will be no slaughterhouses, no vivisection laboratories. No one will hunt animals for fun. And then those from the obvious goes to the not so obvious. But some of the changes are not so obvious. The benefit to man himself of living in a kindlier and more enlightened world can be envisaged only in the broadest outline. His health, physical and mental, will be vastly improved. That was um, that was an interesting uh, theme that they developed quite a lot, that they expected the uh, benefits of veganism 
to be both physical and mental, al almost a kind of um, releasing uh, human beings from the burden of the savagery that they've kind of got involved in, in, in a sense. Uh, will be vastly improved because he will have shared a great deal of the coarser part of his nature. Benefits of the spirit will shower upon him, benefits which today, by his own short-sighted volition, he denies himself. Uh, now, this is a this is a really interesting part. I, 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 lo I love the end of this. Um, such is the stuff of dreams. To make them uh, true requires that we play our part when it uh, comes to us. So that's uh, Ronnie Lee's uh, plea for activism. Uh, we are in the very elementary stage of the new mutation. We are the pioneers. And it's really interesting because I um, used to do a talk um, about 10 years ago um, saying that we are still really, you know, vegan pioneers, that our, our movement is, um, is, not, is not so old and not so well established. And um, it was only really then just kind of taking off and as social movement theory suggests, it's taken off in the kind of problematic way that movements do take take off. In fact, that a lot of people come in, a lot of them don't have the same values as the people who started it. That kind of creates problems. There's a push toward professionalization, all, all those kind of things. But um, that is all kind of part and parcel of uh, the deal. Okay, so, right. So this is Catherine uh, Janaway and her tribute to Leslie Cross in 1980. Um, so Leslie Cross, vegan for 35 years, founder member of the Vegan Society and of the Plamil Society, died peacefully in his sleep on the 2nd of December, 1979. Inspired by his deep love for all life, he looked forward to the day when plant milks would be generally used and a great burden thus lifted from the gentle cow. He, has, uh, he was managing director of Plant Mill Limited when it was at Langley uh, Books, was secretary of the Plant Milk Society until his death, and often used his skills as a journalist to write on behalf of animals. And of course, I suppose we've seen those skills, his journalistic skills in his writing uh, already. We offer our sympathies um, et cetera, et cetera, um, et cetera, and a mention of uh, son and daughter, uh, John, so um, so th there as well. Okay, so we're getting obviously near the end. So we are talking about a very significant player in terms of the beginning of the vegan society, uh, the beginning of plant milks, but also, and this is the most significant term, um, contribution, I, I believe, this evolution of vegan philosophy um, as, as we know it today. And I say that um, I say that with some trepidation, really, because um, this, this philosophy um, that we've just looked at is actually under threat um, at the present day. A, a lot of people don't like it. They think it's too wide. They think it's too radical. They think it's too revolutionary. They want to slim it down. There are a lot of um, reducitarian strands in the modern movement who want to reduce veganism to other animals only, or they want to reduce veganism to a diet um, and in various ways slim down the meaning. There are some people in the modern movement who even really want to redefine veganism as vegetarianism or pescatarianism even, or even allowing for the con uh, the consumption of some animal flesh and still be vegan on the grounds that such a veganism would be bigger than real veganism uh, uh, essentially so that, so that so that's kind of what's going on now i wanted to uh, include this because i think i think a lot of people will really kind of um, resonate with this sentiment from leslie cross he's, he's basically saying He's looking forward to, you know, the coming of the vegan world, but also what issues that itself uh, might bring. Again, I'll go um, full screen on this. As the idea becomes more and more accepted, opportunities will grow to make the path easier and more attractive for those whose nature is not that of the pioneer. 
Now, so that's a really interesting thing, that the idea that you know some people are going to put themselves out rather more for a cause than others. And so the easier it gets, the more we might expect people to join um, in a way. Um, there are some dangers in that kind of idea, but you, you can understand where it comes from. Concurrent with the gradual removal of obstacles to the personal practice, attention will have to be given to the question of how we proceed to deal with animals in general as soon as the changeover from exploitation to freedom reaches a certain stage. It is not difficult to see that such a changeover will bring with it problems of a wide and general character. No one, least of all the vegans, uh, wants a world without animals. This is very evocative of Tom Reagan and the idea that we need people of goodwill to come together at this stage to figure out uh, ways of doing things, you know, vertical farming, what about crop deaths, you know, all, all, all those kind of things. But also these, these two things that non-vegans often say to us, first of all, we'll cause the extinction of millions and billions of other animals. At the same time, they're going to they're going to overcrowd us and, and take over the world, or this, this, kind of, this kind of thing. So these, these are kind of issues that he had in mind. And how in general and how in detail we propose to affect the swing over from exploitation to uh, perversion of freedom and naturalness to be, uh, take, I'm not quite sure what he's getting out there, to, uh, to be quite um, a talking point uh, one fine day. And then, if I may intrude a personal observation, there is little more desirable, I would ask, of providence that um, on that should, such day I sh should dawn while I am still here to experience it. How glorious, for example, to take part in the discussion to, to decide whether for the purposes of the changeover, a, a, na a nature park or an animal sanctuary should be set up in this or that part of the country, and exactly how uh, it should be planned. Okay, apologies for rather butchering that, uh, that end bit there. Um, but I thought it was really kind of nice to, um, to, to finish with, with that, that, this kind of speculation of, of what would happen as we get nearer and nearer to a vegan world. We've probably all had these kind of thoughts, um, you know, about what it would be. And these recognitions that it's going to bring some problems. And so we would need some kind of, um, you know, some uh, people to uh, come together. It's interesting, really, because th there is there is a group doing kind of TikTok um, panels. And um, often farmers will join. And at first, they'll be a little bit, um, oh, I'm not so sure about this. But then when we start talking about virtual farming, the future, you know, ab about things like uh, crop deaths, this kind of stuff, they, they become kind of on board, especially when they realize that subsidies will sort out the finance, financial part of it, if you like. Okay, and finally then, um, <clears throat> this is um, Nicole L. Cross, no relation, and Louis Torres. And um, this is, um, <clears throat> I think it's a Spanish document, but if you if you go to it, if you put in those three names, Nick. Uh, Nicole L. Cross, Torres, and Leslie Cross, you, you'll get it. And there's a, one of those things where you can click and it translates it into English uh, should you uh, need it. And so this is, uh, they finished their article in which actually they um, they do interview uh, John. So, um, so, that, so that's quite interesting. So Leslie J. Cross, no doubt... Uh, guided the concept of veganism as a matter of rights after it began to be described as a set of practices. And so that is a tension there, that um, this set of practices had to be uh, critiqued and replaced with a principle. Uh, Leslie addressed the definition of veganism as an ethical principle, that is, a question based on moral rights, from which practices consistent with that principle are obviously derived. This is what he explained in the definition at the World Forum of 1951. It is important to note that one of the results of this definition is that it makes veganism a principle. That is, of course, a principle uh, from which certain practices flow naturally. 
but it is itself a principle and not a set of practices. And as, as we've seen in terms of the evolution of um, vegan philosophy, um, that was a real kind of big theme that uh, Leslie Cross wanted to kind of emphasize over and over that, you know, we're talking about a philosophical stance from which, you know, it's like, it's like when people say, well, you know, veganism is a diet. Well, no, veganism has, has a dietary component, which is quite large, but the diet always follows the philosophy. It's always driven by the demands of the philosophy. And so, you know, so that, that's the kind of thing, which is even enshrined, if, if you like, in the modern day weaker definition from the Vegan Society, uh, 80, um, 79 through to 88, where where they kind of said, you know, in, in dietary terms. So they're basically saying, well, you know, you can, it's almost like a searchlight. You know, veganism is a principled searchlight which you can direct to, 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 to various things. So that's the way I think that they were uh, getting at it. So um, Andy in the background, have I missed anything? Is there anything that uh, needs to come up in the chat, which I've missed? This has been a great episode. Yeah, sorry about my reading. I did um, I did mess that up a little bit. Uh, John, uh, you must be so proud of your dad's great legacy. Yeah. Um, the great thing about it is that um, for the next, um, I think it's next couple of months, uh, Veg VegFest UK, they have a, an online magazine called Forza Magazine. I think there's four or five of them out now. And um, I'm going to interview, interview John for that, for that mag uh, for the next one. So look, really looking forward to that. And um, it would be great to talk about John, obviously, in his own right, as a vegan of 80 years, all the, all the changes, you know, the traditional um, question you get, of course, all the changes you've seen, you know, and all that, but also, you know, memories of um, his father and this kind of thing. Okay, people. So um, if we're um, if we're done, um, thanks so much for joining me. Um, thanks once more to uh, John Cross for attending because that means a lot. So, okay, people. I'll see you next time for another vegan time tunnel. Take care for now. Hey, Earthlings, <laughs> how are you doing? Um, welcome along to another vegan uh, time tunnel. As you probably know by now, we're putting together an archive of some interesting historical um, issues within the animal uh, movement. Let's call, call it that, animal protection, advocacy. Um, there's different names, obviously, uh, for it. I'm accompanied today by a very feisty cat so expect some disruption i would think i i am at least um also shortly after this particular time tunnel there is a, a special uh, premiere of the director's cut of um andy atkinson's film which is called animal rights we're getting it wrong um which is really good and i'm not saying that because um, i'm in it um I seem, to, I seem to be in it a lot at the beginning, but, but then that's because he's cut, cut my bit up um, a few times. So it just makes it look as though I'm more in it than I am, I think. Anyway, we're um, back to celebrating the powerful female members of uh, the pioneers of the vegan social movement. And we're into uh, the 50s, late 50s, and into the 60s. Now, this is really interesting from the movement's point of view. Um, in the sense that there is um, a sense now that we are starting to see the vegan movement starting its process of moderation uh, in terms of um, a movement away from uh, radicalism. So <clears throat> we'll we'll get into that. Um, but for now, welcome to the time tunnel. <laughs> Yes, 
Yeah, so uh, I call this little kind of mini series within within the time tunnel, uh, the founding mothers or um, the strong female members. Um, obviously, we've got this kind of gender uh, problem in a way that most uh, spokespersons were or the, one, the ones that people know historically or right now are usually men. Um, you know, so we, we, this, is, this is a problem for social movements in general, but it's been a problem in our movement in particular because throughout history, most people in our movement or our movements, if you want to talk about animal rights, animal welfare, anti-vivisection, for example, most people have been uh, women. So there's always that kind of issue, uh, if you like. So uh, Eva Bat was born in uh, 1908 and died in 89. So died at the age of 81. Now, she played quite a significant role in the development of uh, the vegan society. She was a member, um, she was serving member of, um, of the society as chairperson for 15 years. She was also the society's vice president uh, for a while. And one of her most significant uh, contributions was editing something called the commodity pages of the vegan. And she did that for over 20 years. So we'll come back to the details of that because some of it is is pretty kind of interesting. The Society were the publishers of her two fairly famous uh, cookbooks. Uh, at least um, in, for my generation of vegans, um, everybody had uh, Eva Bat's cookbook. So you got um, What's Cooking? And then there was, I can't really find the, um, the original, it was What Else is Cooking? But I think they, those two got subsumed into the things on the screen there you see vegan cookery and the updated one uh, which has obviously got a much more modern appearance to the right there what's cooking is one of those books where you know it was kind of um laminated kind of pages you know and so it was designed to to open up uh there and then when you're cooking uh, and because you can wipe the pages down so everybody had uh, what's cooking it was very kind of fairly kind of famous um book of, of, of uh, the time, my generation, as I said. She was also a um, council member of the American uh, Vegan Society. So that, that's interesting in the sense that there was a different set of claims makers from the American group. They were more into talking about things like ahimsa, which they defined as dynamic harmlessness. So that's quite kind of interesting uh, in many ways. She was also a director of Plamil, and they began selling canned soya milk, um, the concentrated version, in 1965. She also worked for Beauty Without Cruelty. Uh, whenever I, I hear that, uh, the name of that group, I, I can't f forget the fact that they used to sell these kind of fake fur coats or faux fur coats. And... Um, but they used to sell them with a really big badge, absolutely ridiculously sized badge that people used to wear, which said, said make no mistake, my fur is fake. Um, so that's what I remember of Beauty Without uh, Cruelty. She also owned a shop that sold vegan friendly food, clothing and footwear. So she was very active in her time. The first time she appears in the Vegan Society's committee in the listing is 1958. And here we see um, that, I'm gonna put that on, on full screen. Now it's not particularly well reproduced, so you probably won't be able to read uh, much of it. One significant part of this actually though, is you'll see that the vegan on the left, the magazine or the journal, um, so that's, that's where we first encounter uh, Eva Bat. This is winter 1958. Um, but if you see the one uh, on the right there, we can just see the top part of it. It had that strap line, which the sociologist um, Matthew Cole pointed out, um, advocating living without exploitation. So that had kind of gone by the, by the late 1950s. So again, what we might be seeing uh, from a, 
a social movement point of view or from the point of view of the social movement organization known as the Vegan Society is that this might be part of the process of uh, moderation. Now, one person who's talked about moderation within social movements a lot is sociologist Corrie Lee Wren talked about social movement professionalization. And the idea of becoming professionalized kind of sounds good, but it's got pros and cons. First of all, it becomes much more organized, but then the typical um, pattern is that these organizations then start to de-radicalize. And that means that they're moderate, more moderate in terms of what they say and often uh, what they do. And so um, Curry explores this idea in, in a couple of books, but also this journal, Jun uh, Journal of uh, Gender Studies. And she argues that it's rather necessary, a necessary drawback uh, to professionalism is the moderation in goals and in organization. And they must appeal to a larger constituency to support a larger overhead. And so what's that alluding to is that part of the professionalization process is when you end up getting um, things like uh, staff, uh, buildings, offices, physical offices, and that kind of thing. And she also says, uh, quickly won victories are essential for the professionalized organization's fundraising obligations. So this is um, something that is a problem uh, for this movement in particular, in, in the sense that that tends to mean that um, there almost like needs to be a whole series of victories announced every now and again to kind of keep people subscribing to, to your organization, uh, essentially. So that scene, I mean, this is social movement theory, um, and it kind of applies to all social movements, but it certainly applies to the, the animal movement, that if you don't um, if you don't kind of announce a victory every now and again, then you could have a kind of problem, um, if you like. So again, this kind of idea that there might have been some kind of um, move towards welfareism uh, comes out in some of the things that the vegan social movement started publishing in by 1958. For example, this manifesto of animal rights um, is quite interesting. Um, it's very kind of welfareist in tone. Um, if you see the panel to the right there, it says basic principles. Some of those are quite interesting. Life uh, is uh, a oneness, these kind of ideas. Unity is good, this kind of thing. But then there's a lots of cruelty talk. Cruelty is indivisible, uh, those kind of things. And then when you get down to what's called the manifesto for animal rights, it's kind of anything but really. Um, Number one, for the present purposes, the term animal covers all forms of sentient life. And then they contradict themselves straight away in number two. Cruelty to animals shall be defined as any act that a human uh, being towards an animal. And so they, they first say that all other animals are, uh, or all animals are involved. And then they, they make a distinction between humans and other animals. Uh, which caused um, that animal to endure physical or mental pain, uh, which is not for the benefit of that particular animal. Now, this is kind of RSPCA type stuff, which, which is interesting, really, because in most countries' animal welfare laws, there is a recognition that other animals can suffer both physically and also psychologically. So, in other words, there's um, lines like, you shouldn't terrorize um other animals this kind of stuff and so there's this kind of recognition of, of a mental life within animal welfare legislation that often people will reject as though you know other animals are, are not quite there then uh, number three is quite interesting in the sense that it's all about um the kind of limitations of what they're calling animal rights which really is animal welfare all animals shall uh, normally have the right to lie, uh, to live out their lives according to their natural expectation of life, provided, 3A, they do not attack human life when man shall have the right to self-defense. 3B, they are not pests. So that opens up a, a whole bag of um, uh, possibilities. When man shall have the right to defend himself. 
3C, when an animal uh, in pain, so we're talking about um, shall be put down, interesting language, of course, and then uh, 3D, when man would otherwise die of starvation. So it's kind of a very kind of um, heavily curtailed idea of what we would understand as uh, animal rights uh, in, in this day and age. Another thing that was part and parcel of the late 50s society was the crusade against all cruelty to animals. Now this, as far as I'm aware, this is an organization which be, some, somehow became affiliated with the, the vegan society. Uh, and so, um, so Margaret Cooper here kind of appears quite often in the vegan journal at this time, uh, giving accounts of um, of this particular kind of um, crusade, uh, uh, as she calls it, which is quite interesting. One one thing that's interesting about this is that towards the bottom, um, yeah, it talks about humanitarians. So I, I want to say a couple of things ab about that uh, in a while. But they they also talk about um, film meetings. So it's quite interesting, you know, like we tend to think of of kind of like. Uh, evenings full of film being a rather a new thing but they would talk about film meetings one of which they report right at the bottom there um in support of the vegan society at our kensington meeting on september the 30th which was attended by 500 people so that's a pretty good attendance i think we'd be pretty well pleased if we organized a, a film meeting uh, today and we had 500 people in attendance so in terms of moderation then, um, well, first of all, this is the movement that Eva Bat had, had come into. And so she began to be active when this potential moderation had started to occur. And so you end up getting socialized by the movement that you join, of course. So this is only 14 years after the foundation of the Vegan Society. But kind of worse than that, it's only three, four, five years after all the writings of Leslie Cross, who was writing about vegan philosophy over a number of years, starting something like 49 and finishing around about uh, 55. And when, when he said things like veganism was on the side of the, the liberators, it's not about welfare, uh, it's not about cruelty, it's about abolition, it's not about making things better, it's about abolition of use and this kind of thing. And so there is, seems to be a, a distinct um, change in tone, um, really. And I think that um, the next slide might kind of start to point to why this might be. Let me just alter that so you can see it, although I'm not sure you won't be able to read it very well. This is 1959 at this stage. So Eva Bat was producing news items for the vegan, the Journal of the Society, and news items from all over the world. And again, you have to say that most of these were welfareist um, in nature. And it talks about those involved with animal welfare. Uh, all this kind of language is, is kind of replete throughout, throughout this period. And just speculating on this, I tend to think that this is possibly because the society now has found its feet as a social movement organization. And it started to become known it started to make contacts on a global level and so it starts to feature news from its as it were allies and contacts um, from all over the world and all all of that is kind of welfare based in in nature which they're reproducing in the magazine and so there there is this kind of problem i think that there's the potential um to uh, to move towards moderation, again, comes from the potential towards things like um, professional, professionalization, becoming established, and this kind of stuff. And I think this is probably uh, kind of what's going on uh, here. Okay, I'm going to uh, switch tack in a sense, uh, because um, a lot of the work that Eva Bat got involved with was um, about food labeling and about trying to find out which foods were vegan friendly, which then could be reported in the journal. Uh, obviously this is well before the age of the internet and everything. So if you look at, if you look at this, for example, now this is interesting. This is the University of Reading in Britain. 
and it's kind of like a, a bit of a history of food labeling law. And as you can see there, probably on the left, 1943 is where it starts. It kind of goes in reverse order. So we don't really need to look at the details of this, but virtually every year, sometimes more than once a year, there was something that came through, okay, right up to the 1970s. Uh, and that was to do when Britain entered the European or the common market, uh, as it was called. In those days, there's, there's, even, there's even issues coming through to the 1990s um, in this. Now, the interesting part of it is the fact that a lot of these regulations were to do with um, people being conned. In fact, there's a little summary here. So the, the very earliest um, moves towards the regulation of labeling came in 1938. And it says here about um, made it offense to sell a food or a drug uh, which had a label which falsely describes that food or drug or is otherwise calculated to mislead as to its nature, substance or quality. Unless the seller was able to demonstrate that he did not know that the label was incorrect. Just says the label incorrect there. I think it's a typo. So, so this is what we, we've, we, we've got going on. And of course, the, the, the issue for vegans is the fact that um, all this legislation doesn't necessarily mean that um, manufacturers had to specify in very careful terms all the ingredients. And so uh, what the vegans were left doing really was to write to the manufacturers uh, in order to do this. In fact, those who've seen Ronnie Lee talk about this, even when he went vegan in 1972, he said that the label labeling then was still pretty dodgy to the, to the extent that uh, all the vegans were, were eating a peanut butter, which ended, ended up having so-called beef fat um, in it. And so it could really be a kind of problem for vegans. And so in that sense, um, Eva Bat took on this kind of task, if you like. And she did a lot of writing to manufacturers in, all, in order to establish whether their products were vegan friendly. And she became known as the commodities investigator of the vegan society. Um, and let me just see this one. Uh, this is this is the um, the item that was at the top of, of each of of the journal's um, uh, commodities kind of uh, pages. All the following commodities are free of uh, animal content, and we have the insur assurance of the manufacturers that they do not come into contact with animal substances during processing. So all all the kind of issues and worries that we might have as modern vegans were were being, were being um, rehearsed here. This was a time when um, animal charcoal was being used to process white sugar, which is no longer the case um, in Britain, and I don't think in, in much of Europe, uh, probably all of it, I'm not quite sure. And so there was, there was quite a lot um, going on. If I go, if I go back, you, you can see all the, all the different, I don't know if you can see them, uh, but there's all the different manufacturers there being contacted, including Kellogg's, and you know all all these all these these groups, and it's interesting because they're some of them are saying, well, it's we we've got labels. Others are saying, well, no, we can assure you, even though we don't have labels and, and and this kind of stuff. So it was a kind of big deal for the vegans at the time to find out what the vegan friendly um, items were for, for kind of obvious reasons. Um, now this one is uh, let me find out where this one is. This is winter 1959, and so Eva Bat, the commodities investigator, is still busy, and um, she produces an eight-page um, Christmas special um, for this um, issue. And so, what what they're suggesting is is that um, is that each time it, the journal came out, which was four times a year, that that these sections were pulled out and put into a separate file and therefore would end up being the kind of database for each and every member and so they actually put the commodities pages in the middle of the journal so they could be removed without doing any you didn't have to rip them out you could actually just unstaple it and then staple it again so the idea was for uh for, for people to make up their own kind of database and of course later 
that developed into things like the animal free shopper uh, and this kind of thing. So these are some of the concerns of uh, the movement in its kind of early years, in a sense, is the fact that they needed to be able to alert members to what was vegan friendly and what was not. Now, this is an interesting one in the sense that, um, let me put that out down to there. This is uh, the Christmas dinner part of this uh, commodities thing. And you'll see there that um, it's got Julien soup, uh, wholemeal rolls, uh, stuffed Brazil nut roast, gravy, chestnut balls, um, apple sauce, Brussels sprouts, braised carrots, roast potatoes, Christmas pudding, nut cream, mince pies, coffee, and homemade sweets. And then you've got the recipe for all of that uh, laid out um, in the um, uh, in, in the magazine. And so this is quite interesting. I mean, we're talking about the end of the 50s here. Britain is still subject to um, some forms of uh, rationing due to, due to the war years. And yet, you know, often vegans of a certain age will, will get that question. Oh, it must have been so difficult back then. And as you can see, there are some things that uh, were available. And we've... Um, Somebody said that they're hungry. Thanks, Roger. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go and make yourself a Christmas. Um, go and make yourself a Christmas dinner, um, uh, Graham. I'm sure it won't cause any problems. Now, let me just take my cushion down because that was my cat defence, but I don't think I need it now. Uh, also, um, the brown, the brown gravy <laughs> is part of the recipe, which I thought was was quite good. For those people who know me, you know that I'm a big uh, goons fan. And uh, Eccles from the Goons always uh, maintained that he likes chips with brown uh, gravy. So, so the vegans the vegans had everything in, in a sense. Now, just before we get the impression that all the early vegans did was stuff their faces, there is a lot more going on in terms of their correspondence, um, if you like, with the powers that be at the time. So, if we move into the nineteen sixties, for example. Um, Eva Bat wrote to the honorary secretary. Oh, no, sorry, she wrote as the honorary secretary of the Vegan Society to the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Fisheries and Food, which was based in London at the time, probably still is, which uh, was considering yet more recommendations and regulations for food labelling. So she um, she sent a letter, which was effectively a list of the de demands from the vegan world. And if it came to pass, it would have radically shaken up the entire food industries. Uh, for example, this was one of the things that she um, she said. Uh, but argued that the word milk should be used in its technical sense, i.e. as a term for the emulsified liquid, as in vegetable milk, coconut milk, uh, latex milk, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and therefore not used necessarily to denote cow's milk only. Now, this is quite interesting, isn't it? Because there's still these big debates and fights going on between industry and the kind of plant-based industry, if you like, uh, with relation to, you know, who can use words like milk um, and that. And so that's still going on uh, throughout the world, really. She goes on, uh, butter likewise should be referred to as either nut butter or cow butter. Now, I love the I love the idea of um, uh, them having to label it cow butter, which which would be quite an interesting kind of development, um, in a sense. I, I always I always tell people that um, you know cow cow milk is calf food, but um, it would be good to reference cow butter, I suppose. Another fairly brilliant labeling demand was that all uh, food containing animal milk or cream, cow butter or cheese made from animal milk, should be clear. Uh, should clearly state uh, that on the label. And he, she said all foods containing eggs, whether or not intensely produced, which, which is which is good, should also be clearly marked. And so this was um, the vegans trying to make an impact on the ongoing labelling um, regulations that were going on um, in Britain. So that was the demands. 
And of course, not none of you watching or listening to this will be surprised that none of these vegan demands were um, ever met. Um, and so uh, it was the, the vegans were blanked on it, essentially. More generally, she asked about releasing humanity from animal husbandry, which would result in a country such as Britain becoming a next exporter of foodstuff, which is a very kind of early uh, vegan society uh, argument that um, in a vegan world, virtually every country would probably become a uh, food exporter rather than an importer. And so not only was she wanting the government to really crack down on the labeling of um, of foods with um, animal derived ingredients, as it were, she actually wanted them to close down the animal um, agriculture industry in the name of um, food security for the country. And she also wrote uh, again 65 or oh, 64, sorry, um, why a vegan? And um, she she was uh, again arguing that uh, just just think what a vegan world would would um, would mean for what she described as undeveloped. And then she also put in brackets another term for starving peoples in the world, and what a contribution it would make towards world peace. So um, I often feature a. Um, a, a particular um, quote from Why Vegan, which is which is coming up. You won't be surprised, but um, it's it is an interesting uh, document. This one, there is quite a lot of cruelty language in it, but you've also got some of the what I would argue are um, elements of the scope of, of vegan philosophy uh, coming into it. Th th this one um, being uh, one, and uh, as we see when we get to uh, the next uh, the female pioneer, um, <clears throat> Kathleen Janaway, they took seriously the idea that a vegan world would mean the end of war and would mean the end of poverty. They, 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 they took that fairly seriously. And um, here you can see Eva Bat articulating a similar kind of um, idea. She also said, aside from immediate effects, vegans consider this way of life to be no less a duty to future generations. It will make uh, take many ages at the present rate of progress to undo all the results of past wrongs, if indeed this is ever possible. And whatever our, our actions, it is our heirs, even more than we who will reap the results, good or bad, of what we do today, tomorrow, and the next day, until we leave them what? A desert? a conflagration or a garden of a plenty. A conflagration is, um, is destruction by fire. So it's really interesting in, this, in, the, in the sense that they felt um, a desire. Uh, and we've got to remind ourselves that these, these people had, um, you know, just come out of uh, a global conflict and, um, Good or bad? Yes. Well, yeah, that's right. It's kind of, um, you know, uh, in other words, the, the next gen generation will have to deal with, with the results of, of what we do now, good or bad, right? And so she's suggesting that we should do good in order to, to leave them something worth leaving. Um, I think that is the, the argument. Okay, also in Why Veganism, the pamphlet from 1964, Eva ba wrote in it what remains as one of the most powerful uh, assertions of vegan values. And this, for those who have seen my presentation before, uh, will know this uh, particularly well. Veganism is one thing and one thing only, a way of living which avoids exploitation, whether it be of our fellow men, the animal population, or the soil upon which we rely uh, for our very existence. Now, it's really interesting this in in the sense that um i said that there seems to be some movements toward moderation and yet here here in the 1960s uh, eva bat is remaining kind of faithful to the language of the earliest pioneers when they talk about exploitation which they meant use and so uh, avoids use 
And then you've got, again, the scope of veganism being articulated, uh, whether it be of our fellow men, the animal population, or the soil upon which uh, we rely. And so, again, there's this kind of um, intertwining of, of issues, which was part of the, of the vegan uh, scope, um, I would suggest. Um, this last bit always creates some concern or comment. Um, like the other movement pioneers, uh, Eva Bell would often talk a good deal about the soil. Um, she talked about it in terms of, of the correct balance, um, in terms of its conservation, and as part of the correct long-term use of the land. So that, that was a particular interest uh, to vegans. And you'll see next time that Kathleen Jenaway was in particular very concerned ab about these issues. I always say that this issue came back into the movement in the 1980s with the publication of a very influential book by John Robbins, which is called Diet for a New America, where he, he talked about topsoil and topsoil erosion, these kind of issues, and about how um, you know there, there is just this thin layer of, of soil separating rock from sky, essentially. And without it, we can't survive. Uh, and yet we do incredible amounts of damage to it. And they were concerned about that. Uh, way way back into the 50s and the 1960s. That was concerned that her generation of vegans needed to ensure that they protect the soil to, as it were, hand it over to the next generation. And they wanted to hand it over as a valuable heritage. Um, and they, they wanted it to be not eroded or scorched or leached of its essential minerals, which are so necessary for a full and healthy life, uh, she wrote. It's interesting, this idea of, of, of being concerned about handing over, uh, you know, a good planet, essentially, to the next generation. Um, I suppose that she didn't know that future generations and our generation would be much more ignorant of these issues than their generation uh, was. I mean, now we kind of act as though we don't care much about anything but consuming things, whereas they were really concerned with issues of conservation over generations they, they were thinking of. And you don't tend to get um, that, um, you know, that kind of sense of things uh, nowadays. Um, the role and hard work of the women pioneers was clearly as important um, as the men in the movement. And again, this is bittersweet perhaps in practical terms perhaps more so the the women did end up doing cookery demonstrations and um you know doing the writing as it were to the uh, the ministries etc to find out the vegan friendly stuff and so there there is again that kind of gender divide which is very kind of stereotypical um, i suppose uh, the women were it, it invariably given the job of researching the food suitable for vegans as i've said and managing and running of cookery demonstrations um, up and down the country, uh, which they did to great effect in, in actual fact. So, um, so they they did that job well. But it's quite interesting from a, a feminist point of view that it was primarily the women who who did that. Although on retirement, uh, Leslie Cross did uh, go around the country, but that was on a kind of lecture tour rather than a cookery um, demonstration tour. So again, I suppose that's just a reproduction of that uh, gender issue. Right, I'm gonna finish off with um, about three minutes of um, film from the uh, recently enhanced um, version of um, Open Door. Now, Open Door is a really interesting uh, historical document. It, it looks incredibly dated when you see it. Um, it was produced in 1976. Um, as, as Ronnie Lee said in a recent program, um, he watched this when it went out. In fact, this is one of, one of the big things that, 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 that nailed kind of veganism down for a lot of people around, around him at the time. He'd been vegan uh, for, for a few years by then. But he said in terms of the language, which we're going to find a bit amusing, this was just the language of the BBC in those days. So what had happened essentially was the BBC had 
had said to social organizations, well, look, if you want to promote your yourself, we'll come along with all our equipment. You, you can say what you want and we'll just film it and help you with the editing and all the rest of it. And so that's what the open door thing, uh, as it were, is all about. So it's really kind of interesting um, in that sense. There was a previous one uh, for the Hunt Saboteurs in this series, which ended up being a big recruitment tool. Ronnie says that um, many, many vegans um, joined the movement of many people kind of, as it were, went vegan on the, on the basis of this particular um, uh, program, which was only well, it's about 28 minutes long. So I've got a three minute clip which features Eva Bat to end with. So here we go. <laughs> Society was formed in 1944. Let's face it, Erica. Cow's milk is for calves, not for humans. Yes. And we have other athletes in our society too, like Jack McClelland, a wrestler, footballer, and cross channel swimmer. And they all agree that milk is a baby food, not fit for strong men. Eva Bat. Eva is chairman of our vegan council. Tell us, Eva, how you became a vegan. I remember very clearly, Erica, well that was nearly 20 years ago. There was this railway station platform and there were some cows herded at one end and they were making a very pathetic noise. And at the other end were baby calves, very, very young, and they too were crying for the mother cows. And of course I asked an official, why couldn't they be put together? And he explained. That the cows were going to market and the calves were coming to the butcher. To the butcher, I said. Why? Well, he said, you can't have milk unless cows keep having calves. And you can only rear a few of those calves as cows. Most of those other poor little things have been real and hand by before long. This shook me. I hadn't realised that. Uh, milk production was responsible for all the suffering and slaughter. I had pictured placid, gentle cows happily grazing in green pastures, and I thought how kind the farmers were to relieve them of their milk. I turned again to the cows, because one was nudging my shoulder, trying to attract my attention, and as I turned, she gazed straight into my eyes, and there was a real message. That's the time it came through to me. I knew then I could never drink milk again. And I hadn't. But believe me, I had a terrible time over that weekend, just wondering how I was going to manage. I knew people could live well without meat. But without milk, I knew you thought I was going to die. So you can imagine how delighted I was when I discovered that there were other people who were living happy, healthy lives as vegans, thinking the way I did. And today, on my 68th birthday, I am feeling, I too, I should say, I'm feeling happier, healthier, and altogether better than ever before. So, um, how many times are we going to see those scenes? I mean, that, that those scenes there were, were um, 
filmed in the 1970s. And we've seen it over and over, generations later, uh, separation of mother and child, with the mother following, um, presumably not knowing what to do. I don't know whether you actually picked up on this, but the, the young, young guy of the two kept glancing back at the mother. And that's possibly because he probably knew that sometimes the mothers get a little bit defensive and, you know, might actually attack them, which we've again seen um, in subsequent films, because they're having their babies taken away from them, you know, and that happens over and over. And then farmers have the goal to say, oh, well, you know, uh, some mothers are not very good mothers. How, how many How many babies would a human mother need to have taken away from them? And there's an Irish film where the farmer used the phrase snatched, uh, uh, that the newborn calf was snatched from the mother. How, how many b before you stop be be, you know, being a good mother? So that is a very kind of modern part of the, the film. I know it's got that kind of very, very dated uh, look about it. At the same time, that scene, you, you could go and film that tomorrow at a dairy farm because it's always the same and it's always, you know, completely pitiful. The separation of a mother from a child, probably one of the most horrible things that anybody could do and to do it repeatedly uh, and for profit is just pretty disgusting. Okay, uh, vegan rant over from me. So that, um, that folks is your uh, vegan time tunnel. And, um, yeah, and he says, 50 years later, and we're still stealing babies. Um, the movement seems to be uh, full of strong women from the foundation. Uh, they just don't get some of the attention or accolades that some of the men do. Yeah, that's right. I guess that's still a societal issue uh, we must address. It, it's it's a social issue that is um, replete, repeated everywhere. When, when, I, when I kind of dabbled in um, academia, and when I was kind of running things like seminars and stuff, you always had to manage them on gendered lines in the sense that it, it was very regular for men or a couple of men to kind of uh, dominate the session. And, and you kind of really had to be a, a gatekeeper and said, OK, any, anyone else? And it was very common to, to get kind of gobby guys and silent women. And it's really... Uh, unfortunate. Now, obviously, that's a stereotype and it doesn't apply to everyone, but it was pretty common um, in my experience. And then when I became a lecturer and other people did the, uh, the seminar part of it, they had the same kind of problem. And so we had to try to devise uh, ways of trying to encourage um, the women in the group to contribute because they, they were almost constrained by the culture, essentially. Patriarchy, I think it's called. Correct me if uh, if I'm wrong. Okay, people. Um, oh, right, another one. Um, I remember reading an activist, albeit she was representing Peter. You 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 had to make me say that word, didn't you? I, I yeah, okay. Um, say no. Uh, nobody paid any attention to me until I went uh, out in my yes. Right, that's right. And I think that really demonstrates just how broken uh, it all is. Well. Uh, I mean, the recent Peter thing involved um, a 40 uh, or a, a, an actor, a female actor in her 40s who took her clothes off, usual thing. And she did uh, a publicity video for Peter explaining why she did it. And she basically said, well, look, I have to take my clothes off. Otherwise, no, nobody's going to take any notice of me. So e even now in the 21st century, that's still sadly uh, the same and it's just an indictment uh, still of the values of um, society still dominated by the ideology of uh, patriarchy which for a group like Peter is excuse my language boils down to get your tits out for the animals unfortunately but that's been their thing for many many years uh, sadly and it's been one of the reasons why quite a lot of progressive people will shun our movement because we don't seem to have the um, credentials uh, as a progressive social movement as far as they're concerned but that is a, an argument for elsewhere All right people thank you so much then for tuning in now a reminder that uh, 
in a few minutes' time, or um, probably about 35 minutes, I believe, or maybe 30 minutes, uh, Andy Atkinson, the, the new vegan filmmaker, uh, is doing a director's cut of his first substantive film, which is called Animal Rights, We're Getting It Wrong. I had the pleasure of seeing it uh, last night, and um, it's really good, and there's uh, about 15 minutes extra in it. Um, the editing is better on uh, Andy's new machine, which uh, which we're pleased to have been able to help uh, buy for him because the production of the first film actually blew his 11-year-old laptop out of the sky. And so we had to get him some equipment pretty sharpish. The movement uh, rallied round, and now we have it. And so you can expect a stream of content beginning this evening uh, with that uh, director's cut, which is also enhanced and improved visually and, um, and in terms of audio. So I look forward to that. And I look forward to seeing you all again uh, next week for another Time Tunnel. So thanks a lot for tuning in. Uh, just to say that there is a written version, as I mentioned before, uh, and this is a force of vegan. Uh... Hello, Earthlings, and welcome along to uh, another uh, vegan time tunnel. You're uh, more than uh, welcome, so um, thanks for joining me. So um, the regular viewers will know that we're putting together an archive of significant uh, issues and events, etc., in the animal movement. And so uh, this is one of those. And we're back into the vegan social movement pioneer uh, territory uh, with Arthur Ling um, this week. So um, just put my eyes on. So as ever, uh, people, if you're watching um, on any other um, platform besides my YouTube channel, that's the best place to go if you want to see the full chat and also to interact with the chat. If you do comment on Facebook, I will be able to see it and respond to it, but uh, you won't be able to see if anybody responds to you, um, that kind of thing. And as ever, uh, in terms of the comments, um, you know, this channel never makes anybody kind of pay to have your comments put on the screen. So um, that's not going to be a thing uh, to happen. I, li I like the dark green this week. It's nice, isn't it? That's uh, that's uh, quite a nice um, color. OK, we've got quite a few in the house. So thanks for joining us. And uh, as ever, welcome along to another vegan time travel. <laughs> So, Arthur Ling, the Plemil King, um, is the title today. So, we're going to look at uh, that. Um, Arthur Ling was an honorary patron and also a president for a while of the Vegan Society. Ah, hello there, Philip. So, um, yes, we might, we might we might mention uh, Philip and I are working on a special or a series of specials, time tunnels. So um, we might be able to uh, at least give you a a, li a little teaser uh, at that. Perhaps at the end, um, we'll see. Okay, Arthur Ling. Then um, quite a lot of resources um, for this one. Um, first off. Um, I'm using The Vegan, the magazine from spring 2005, uh, a Vegan Views um, article from 1986. Uh, the Vegan Forum uh, is another resource. 
uh, Plamel, the website uh, itself, um, including here you see um, Adrian Ling, uh, Arthur's son, described as the vegan Willy Wonka, um, which um, seems to be a title that uh, Adrian is quite happy with so and plays up to, so that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Another of the resources is Forbes, um, again, uh, of the, the kind of modern plum mill um, stuff, if you like. And then finally, we have the vegan from the winter of 1956. So actually, in my notes, I've got 1856. So I'm assuming that's a typo. So uh, that's an interesting one. Now, speaking of interesting, this is interesting because when um, Arthur was near the end of his life, he was in hospital, so he got lots and lots of cards sent in. And one of them included this poem uh, by Bernie Leprade. I'm saying Leprade, so sorry, Bernie, if I'm getting that wrong. Um, so uh, we raise a glass to toast your class. We're lucky you stopped here. Please take a bow from every cow whose life you helped to save and one from every vegan on the road you helped to pave. So that's a pretty good um, tribute. Uh, the Bernie reports, and that was in the vegan forum, I believe, that um, sadly uh, the card got there too late. So Arthur didn't actually see it before he died, which was a bit sad, but... Um, he says in his little report, if you're looking down, here's the, uh, here's the poem uh, as you would have received it. Now, you might re recall that uh, in an earlier time tunnel about Leslie Cross, um, I mentioned that when Donald Watson was interviewed in 2002, he was kind of asked about significant contributors to the movement. And he said he was rather loath to pick um, any out, but he thought it only right for him to mention Leslie Cross and Arthur Ling. And he says here, they were outstanding faithful con um, contributors to um, our cause. And um, when Arthur died, th this is from the vegan of 2005, um, they mentioned that uh, Watson had said that um, as well. So it's a, a fitting tribute, if you like, to, uh, uh, to both of them, uh, really. Um, I suppose I, you could say a little bit tough on some of the female pioneers, um, but um, th those are the ones that Watson chose to highlight, um, if you like. Okay, I mentioned that Adrian Ling is Arthur's son, and he's now the managing director of uh, Plan Mill Foods. So he gets to regularly talk about, uh, and he's often regularly interviewed, about the pioneering work uh, of his father. And uh, one thing he says here, a true achievement and again, far ahead of its time. This was the development of, um, of soy milk uh, in Britain. It is said that um, Arthur Ling was not one of the original founders of the vegan movement, but he joined pr pretty soon afterwards. So uh, he joined in 1945 when the movement was only one year old. In fact, there are some claims about him joining in 1944 itself, the year of the foundation. So let's compromise and just say mid-1940s, uh, uh, Arthur Ling got involved, and so therefore he was uh, involved right uh, from the start, uh, really. Now, when we get to the 1950s and onwards, for the rest of his life, really, his focus, along with some others, again, including Leslie Cross, was on the development of uh, plant milks. Now, it's interesting, really, because this was a really kind of pioneering time for vegans and veganism at the time. For example, um, they had to write off to companies to find out if existing products were vegan friendly, for example, is one of the main things they found themselves doing. But also, they were in the process of working out what products uh, were needed for the future. And of course, uh, they settled on the idea that uh, the development of plant-based milks would be um, very important. And so that's what Arthur Ling and Leslie Cross um, also uh, 
they kind of set themselves to that task uh, in, in a way. Now, uh, Ling took his first steps towards veganism in 1926, which is pretty remarkable in terms of uh, how long ago that was. He began refusing to consume flesh and eggs uh, when he was only seven years old. And of course, in 1926, no one had heard of veganism or knew what a vegan was since that it would be another 20 years or so before the word was coined and the vegan social movement uh, was founded. So he was a real kind of pioneer um, in that sense and from um, a very young age. There are, there are quite a few stories of um, people who kind of went vegetarian then vegan very early on. I, I, I know a few, including uh, one person who went vegetarian at four years old and persuaded the rest of her family to do so. And then by seven, she was um, fully vegan and so were they. So that's um, pretty good. In terms of the man himself, Arthur Ling, uh, he was described quite often as sporty. For example, he played tennis and badminton for many decades. In the 1970s, he founded and ran a local boys uh, football club. Uh, he, he wanted to give them kind of training so they could possibly get into the uh, football uh, league. And he organized at least one mini marathon for vegans and vegetarians. Um, I'm not quite sure whether Plum will still do that, but um, I could be wrong about it just being one, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, Arthur was described as a sun lover and also a fan of cold showers. And one of our um, regular uh, viewers is also a, uh, such a, a fan of this uh, uh, terrifying idea of a cold shower. But um, I won't out you um, <laughs> in the show. But um, yeah, uh, so Arthur was not alone uh, in liking cold showers. It, there is a story that he had um, a shower unit um, put in his uh, garden so he could shower outside because um, another thing that he was was a naturist, which is interesting. So um, he would, uh, I, I don't know what the situation was in terms of large walls around his building or anything, but um, that's another thing that, uh, that went on. One thing about Arthur Lee, uh, he's often described again as not one for social norms. Uh, as someone who is rather anti-establishment in outlook. Uh, it's an interesting really because Samantha Calvert, the um, communications officer of the Vegan Society, said that quite a few of the early members and pioneers of the movement were kind of like that, that they were kind of um, anti-establishment, you know, anti-authoritarian, that kind of thing. So he was all those things, but also a very practical uh, person. Um, and he set out to research the nutritional aspects of a plant diet. That was one of his focus um, in the end. Uh, he said that he was blessed to have some knowledge of company law, for example. That's how practical uh, he was. It's quite interesting, the idea of somebody describing um, knowledge of company law as a blessing. But uh, he did, uh, in fact, uh, do that. And so... It's um, it is um, interesting that uh, he, fo he focused on veganism first, and then this need for um, plant milks, um, if you like. And so the Plant Milk Society was set up to promote the manufacture and sale of a satisfactory alternative to dairy or other animal milk used for human consumption. The ingredients of such alternatives are to be exclusively of plant um, origin. Um, also, we could say, well, in the winter edition of The Vegan, um, it included the full text of a report of the first annual general meeting of the Plamil Society. Arthur Ling was the chairperson uh, in this uh, AGM, and Leslie Cross was the secretary. It was reported that some um, that the society achieved some important media coverage 
including in the pages of the London Evening News of 1954, the heading being, Now Your Milk May Come From a Plant. I just want to um, point out at this um, point that this clipping here is uh, copyright uh, Plamil, uh, the company, so thank you for uh, allowing that. And in fact, uh, that one in, as well, going back, uh, that is also copyright uh, for uh, for that purpose. And also thanks to Tim Barford of VegFest uh, UK. Um, so there, there are earlier versions of uh, this time tunnel in written form. I'll talk about that a little later. And so that's where these materials uh, came from. So after reports in what was called the foreign press, inquiries from around the world uh, were received about the um, adventure into uh, plant milks. Uh, Cross notes that they received two tins of non-dairy milk from a Californian company. And the vegan Riley commented that these tins, quote, conforms to American standards of nutrition and hygiene. So apologies for any people tuning in from the United States. There's a little bit of British snobbery <laughs> there in that uh, comment from within the vegan. So it was another nine years, really, before Plan Mill was launched uh, in Britain. They, they got themselves organized, and uh, it was the first commercially available um, plant uh, milk. At one point, the company developed some pretty novel ideas. One I remember is that they supplied Plamil mini pots uh, to airlines, these the little pots of, of uh, milk uh, to cater for airline passengers, which, um, which was quite an interesting um, thing to do. I always tell the story that I remember being at uh, the Welsh village of Clanfair PG, the one that ends go, go, go. And, um, and so uh, I was there and there was indeed some of these uh, little pots uh, there, although that was actually a railway station. So uh, there you go. So Plan Mill now produces a wide range of plant milks, chocolate spreads, um, a host of vegan chocolate bars, egg-free mayo, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just gonna switch for a couple of minutes just to, this is the, the website, uh, Plan Mill. So these are the chocolate bars uh, available, as you can see, plentiful supply. In fact, it even says load more. So let's do that. So if, if you're a, a chocolate lover, it seems that they've got you covered, Plamil, there. And then um, down the bottom here, I think, is lots of other um, products, uh, as you can see. Then there's um, a little bit of company history, which is where I've got some of the... Uh, resources from for today so that's um that's interesting check out the plamil uh, website it's still as it were um, ongoing right uh switch to that okay i almost forgot how to do it then so um as said then arthur ling was well versed in company law and used his expertise to aid both plamil the company and the Vegan Society and Social Movement Organization. Uh, Plan Mill began production in a rented factory in Iver, a place called Iver, which is in Buckinghamshire. And Ling said that they knew that they would have to move. It would be necessary at some point because they were aware that a property developer would buy out the entire site that they were on uh, eventually. And so they, they knew at some point they would have to, um, to move. Uh, luckily, this forced change of premises didn't occur until 1972. And by then, there was a group of 16 vegans that were set up to financially support uh, the move. And that was to a new factory in Folkestone. And that's uh, below London for people who don't know the geography, below London on the south coast of uh, of England, uh, Folkestone, Kent, uh, where in 19, um, what was it 1975 I saw T-Rex, but that is a complete diversion of things, but never mind. Now, Leslie Cross, who had been the only employee of the business at the time, he retired and Arthur Ling uh, replaced him. 
And it was at that point that the name Plamil was formally uh, adopted. In terms of what Arthur Ling's expertise provided for the Vegan Society, uh, and in terms of his long association with them as their honorary uh, patron and also president, his concern was to put the organization on a stable footing, for example, by buying uh, premises for the organization itself. Uh, you may recall in my Kathleen Janaway time tunnel that I mentioned that the Vegan Society was often located in the houses of their officers and officials, uh, and that was for many years. And of course, that's not really an ideal situation for a national social movement organization. So this move, this development, um, and the development of the society's trademark is believed to have placed the organization on a secure footing into the future in terms of its longevity and its finances, etc. So we could say, as always, that 21st century uh, vegans have pioneers like uh, Arthur Ling to thank for their foresight in these kind of uh, matters. As a side note, this is interesting, there's a little known provision in the Vegan Society's Articles of Association, and Arthur Ling was a big fan of this. So in something called Objects, which is section 4b of the Articles of Association, it reads this, to relieve elderly vegans who are in need. So I'm a vegan of 44 years and also in my 60s, so I think I'll be knocking on their door um, fairly soon. So thanks, Arthur, for that. Makes you wonder whether anybody knows about that provision and whether it's still honored, really, isn't it? Because I've not heard of them setting up a home for elderly uh, vegans. I do believe there is um, a vegan and vegetarian rest home somewhere in Wales. But whether that's part of this, um, I don't know. Okay, so as uh, Bernie Leprade's poem suggests, and again, apologies if um, if I spelled, uh, pronounced your name uh, wrong, Bernie. Arthur Ling helped a great many vegans over the years, not only through his, his long years with the Vegan Society and Plamil, of course, but also on a personal level too. He was especially helpful to new vegans taking their first step along the way or their first part of their vegan journey, as some people say, and I know some people uh, dislike uh, that um, idea. For example, a v um, Arthur Ling was the inspiration for, oh, I'm behind on my thing. Uh, Arthur Ling was the inspiration behind the first ever Vegan Buddies initiative, which was an important landmark itself uh, in vegan history. Vegan Buddies was launched by the late Neil Lee, and there is a, a time tunnel special about Neil Lee, uh, which features uh, Ronnie Lee, uh, no, um, <laughs> uh, no relatives. Um, who was then, Neil Lee was the editor of an activist magazine called Art News uh, in the 1990s. And also the co-founder of Vegan Buddies was Mary Brady. So when Mary was four or five months pregnant, she became a vegan and um, she was feeling a little nervous about the pregnancy and she wanted some dietary advice. So she enterprisingly phoned the number which was on the back of a Plamil carton. And she found herself, much to her surprise, put through to Arthur Ling himself. And she says this, and this was part of uh, her tribute to him after he died. Said, he talked to me for ages on the phone, answering my questions, reassuring me, and being a vegan buddy. Two days later, there arrived in the post his booklet on raising vegan kids and pages of handwritten notes and recipes. So I continued vegan and a healthy uh, vegan and my son was born eight pounds, 12 ounces and uh, is now a lifelong vegan, nine years old, 29 kilograms and five foot, uh, four foot, five, perfectly healthy. Interestingly, Mary would eventually meet Arthur face to face at a, a vegan festival, uh, which had begun uh, by then. 
Arthur recognized Mary's voice from the phone call that they had had years earlier. And soon Mary's son, uh, the object of their um, issue, I suppose, uh, bombed past them, as she put it, with another child. Uh, apparently Arthur smiled and said, he never did get rickets, did he? And as we know, you know, non-vegans often say to vegans, uh, especially pregnant vegans, that uh, there's going to be all kinds of uh, issues if they continue with their um, pregnancy. In the year of Arthur Ling's death, the London Vegan Festival of 2005 was dedicated to his memory and also to his work, as was the spring 2005 edition of the Vegan Magazine, which you can still find uh, online by looking looking it up in a website called Issue, which is S uh, I S S U U Issue. The Arthur Ling Memorial, Memorial uh, Award, set up and run by Plamil Foods, is granted each year to an individual or group for their outstanding contribution to the cause of uh, veganism. So. Uh, Arthur Ling's uh, legacy certainly uh, lives on, uh, not least um, through the work of uh, his son. This is Adrian, in fact, uh, announcing news uh, of his father's death. It's, a it's actually taken from something else and then put into a uh, vegan uh, forum uh, by somebody else. Um, Adrian had written that his dad was anti-war and egalitarian, a supporter of the common man, he said, an outdoors person. So I kind of cleaned, cleaned it up in, um, <laughs> in, in terms of what's PC nowadays, uh, a naturist, as um, I mentioned before, known in his village for early morning swims, and as I said before, a sports uh, lover. Okay, so um, we... <laughs> I see there's some comments. I, I'll get back to them. I, I, I don't have a uh, co-pilot this uh, this week, so I'll uh, come back to those in a minute. Uh, just to say that there is a written version, as I mentioned before, uh, and this is the Force of Vegan uh, online magazine. Uh, there's also another written version if you go to VegFest UK, um, their website, and if you look on the tabs, you'll see one which says, um, I don't know, what, it, what is it? Uh, you know, something about not forgetting your history. I can't quite remember the um, uh, the, the way it is uh, is put. Um, but the Force of Vegan one is best, and the cartoon there is, um, I suppose, in uh, praise of uh, Ling's naturism. And then finally, there's just a publicity shot here. Um, again, uh, this is copyright Plamil, and also veganchocolate.co.uk which is a, um, uh, is a, uh, a website associated with, uh, with Plamil. Okay, so let me look at, uh, I see that Ho Homi has made a few comments here. I turned in late, um, I won't be able to stick around. Um, ooh. Ah, um, I, I won't be covering this. I, I am aware of it. I am aware of claims that the vegetarian society's vegan standards are stricter than the, the vegan societies. So I, I, do, I do know what you're talking about. Um, I don't know um, the details, uh, but I, I, do, I do know uh, what you're saying. Um, it, it is... Um, it is it is a bit tricky now because of of these this issue of um, if you go to a product, um, then you've got to look for the the, the vegan um, sign, but also the leaping bunny uh, in in uh, Britain, for example, uh, you know, the so called cruelty free kind of thing. So you need kind of both uh, to make sure it's vegan friendly. But um, yeah, I do know that there is some concern that either the vegan society criteria has slackened a bit or i'm not quite sure if it if it was not not so not so strong um strong uh in the first place uh much of the chocolate in vegan products made by others 
from Plum Hill. It's a niche that saved the company from going under. Yeah, okay. I think uh, Homie may have left, but um, let me just... Um, I don't actually know how the uh, spat ended. Okay, uh, well, uh, we're in the same boat there. Uh, it was the problem of animal products contaminated. Yeah. So as I said, these these kind of so-called cruelty-free things um, can be a problem. Um, I saw in my local supermarket a um, product which was labeled cruelty-free and was um, endorsed by Peter in North America, but that it ended up containing honey. So um, you've got to you've got to be quite careful with uh, with these things. I think. Um, again, homie, my recollection. Uh, recollection is Arthur didn't think they should be labeled out oh, and they proposed his own. Oh, okay, and standard. Hold on. As they do. Yeah, as I said, um, I don't know whether this is true. I certainly don't know the details of it, so I can't comment on, on that in particular. But um, I, I do know that there is arguments, uh, shall we say, about. Um, you know ab about the kind of uh, criteria used for these kind of um, uh, trademarks, and of course, um, it is true that I think that is the main source of uh, finances for the Vegan Society. So, whether whether that creates any issues, again, I, I can't speculate on that. I don't I don't really kind of uh, know, uh, to be honest. Right. So, uh, a nice, concise, uh, short one. Uh, today, folks. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, I'll see you later, um, Philip. So, um, yeah. So, as I said, uh, Philip and I are kind of working with with others on a couple of specials, maybe three, um, um, about uh, developments in the United States of America. So that should be coming up um, fairly soon. So, as I said, a nice, concise one. I hope you enjoyed that. I think, um, well, through the work of uh, Andy Atkinson, um, he, he um, kind of unearthed some vegan pioneers that were were kind of even more unknown than <laughs> the, the regular vegan pioneers, if that makes sense, particularly the women. And um, so there, there might, I must look into a few of those and they might appear as um, time trolls as well. But until uh, next time, uh, whenever that is, I'm not quite sure. I have been repackaging some of the time tunnels and other uh, things from the archives, which uh, at least three regulars have said that they've got a lot from, in the sense that by watching them more than once, you you, you discover things that you'd missed or nuances that you'd not caught, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm glad, I'm glad that they're kind of working in that sense. So there will be more. I did do, um, last night I did do the trilogy, the American trilogy of the, you know, the birth and death and the resurrection, if you like, of the animal rights movement in North America. So there will be some more of those, I'm sure, and also some more live um, vegan time tunnels. So until then, I'll see you. Thanks for watching. Hey, Earthlings, welcome, welcome, welcome. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a croaky uh, voice uh, today for some reason. Uh, also, I've um, had an email from StreamYard, uh, which is the platform that I'm streaming from, and uh, they've got some technical issues. So I don't know whether that means that I'm going to be a little bit uh, jittery or what, but uh, let's hope it doesn't get anything kind of worse <clears throat> than that. So, people, thanks very much for uh, tuning in. Um, as the regulars will know, we're putting together an archive of um, interesting uh, events and uh, people, etc., from the history of the vegan or the animal uh, movement. And today we've got the last, or at least one of the last, 
of the founding mothers, as I call them, the powerful women pioneers of the vegan social movement. So, um, so Kathleen Janaway uh, will be meeting today, looking at her, uh, her life and her work, which is all pretty uh, impressive, as you'll see. So, people, welcome then to the Vegan Time Talk. <laughs> Accelerating a trend to veganism is the most important thing we can do today to save all highly developed forms of life on this planet. We live at momentous times, at what could be a terrific turning point in evolution. Nothing to my mind can exaggerate the importance of veganism. Yes, indeed. So uh, that was Kathleen Janaway, as I'm sure you won't be surprised. I'm just going to uh, knock a couple of things off here to try and help with the uh, the technological uh, issues. So that film clip there, and there, there will be a later one of the same thing. Um, it comes from 1992, and it was the sixth international vegan festival. And it's recently been enhanced by Andy Atkinson, our new famous uh, filmmaker on the block. And um, so you need to go to his YouTube channel if you want to see um, all of it. Um, oh, hi, Curry. Hello there. I'm glad you can make it. All right. Let's see about this. Okay, so that is um, not your mum, spelled the English way, M-U-M, but it, the, then there's a dot. So not your mum dot, not your mo, uh, not your milk, that's it. And so that's the YouTube channel. Uh, so I think there's about 88 enhanced videos now, which um, have a better uh, video quality, but in particular, there's a better audio quality. So it's well worth uh, having a look because we do realize in this day and age that if things are not particularly good in terms of production uh, quality, then there can be a problem. We'll encounter that uh, in a little uh, while, in fact. <clears throat> now, in the talk that I referenced there, um, Kathleen Janaway does talk about the importance of trees, which became, in the end, her main campaigning focus. And so this is when she switched from the Vegan Society to something called Movement for Compassionate Living, which is still online. You can still find, find their website. Okay, so Kathleen Janaway was born in 1915, and she died in 2003. She's very fondly uh, remembered by a lot of people, including someone called David Graham, who is the co-founder of this, which is a, a journal, Growing Green International. It's kind of twice week. Uh, yearly and it's published by the vegan organic network uh which um Janaway seemed to have something to do with the foundation of or the expansion of in fact movement for compassionate living once got a legacy of eighty thousand pounds and uh, the first thing they did was give 75 70 thousand pounds of it away to the vegan organic uh, network they were trying to create a center uh, and their, their aim was to promote veganism, non-violence in farming, and a cooperative model for working. So David Graham writes this in um, an article called The Legacy of Kathleen Janaway. About 20 years ago, Jane and I, that's the co-founders of Vegan Organic Network, <coughs> went to a meeting in an ob obscure hall uh, in a back street in Glossop, uh, Derbyshire. I can't remember the title of the talk, but I remember the speaker, Kathleen Janaway. There was nothing grey about her. He, he talks about Glossop being rather grey, and I've been through through there often enough to know that that's true. Although she was uh, friendly and warm, there was fire and challenge in her manner and her delivery. 
And as usual with Jan Owen, she draws together all the threads that was kind of really part of um, the pioneers' uh, veganism um, at the time. So we're talking about themes about war and peace, injustice, social exclusion, uh, cruelty, animal rights, hunger, and consumerism. I would throw in animal exploitation to uh, to kind of uh, knock the edge off the cruelty bit, of course. Uh, he said her talk was informed, objective, but at the same time, passionate and moving. She talked about how food was grown and how the slaughterhouse, a house of slaughter, uh, is a symbol of repression. So that is kind of like really the, the stock kind of talk that uh, Janaway would deliver, bringing all these themes together. So in that sense, quite uh, impressively so. Uh, when she was the editor of The Vegan, the formal journal of the Vegan Society, she encouraged the development uh, and publication of vegan views. So um, these pictures are some of the early ones and then some of the, the later ones, if you like. Um, and it really is interesting because um, there was a lot of argument in the vegan society because their first magazines looked very much like these ones on the left. Uh, and then they started to use photography, which was controversial at the time. And it seems like the vegan views uh, have done that as well. So Vegan uh, Views was kind of more informal than the uh, official vegan journal. And it was designed really as a forum for discussion. It was obviously pre-internet. And so therefore, um, you know, it was important to be able to produce these kind of newsletters, which essentially this was with some news, um, you know, kind of added in. I, I remember both the Vegan News and the Vegan Society magazine, of course, in the radical bookshops of the 1980s. So writing in vegan uh, views then, at the time of Kathleen Janaway's death in 2003, Henry uh, Martha wrote this. She married Jack Janaway. They shared a radical outlook and seeking a fairer, a more caring world and became conscientious objectors during the war. They were also Quakers. It was a successful partnership with Jack, although uh, never prominent, was constant and reliable support in all of Kathleen's uh, work. During the war, whilst she was preparing a meager ration of lamb, bunny rabbit ears, Kathleen heard a commotion outside and saw lambs uh, in the field, and in fact, a, a slaughterhouse truck too. They both uh, suddenly made the connection and became vegetarians. In 1964, Kathleen read a review of the book Animal Machines by Ruth Harris. She then made the connection between milk production and the need to slaughter superfluous male calves. Uh, once she became a vegan, in 1971, having raised three children, she took over as secretary of the Vegan Society and dedicated her mind and energy to the vegan cause. So even, even with these tributes, we can see that um, Kathleen Janaway's life and her work was very important in terms of the history of the vegan uh, social movement. So as I said above then, uh, she was born in 1915 and died in 2003 at the age of 87. She had uh, working class origins and it was these working class values of her parents and, grand and grandparents that were to shape her radical vision of the future. And that future for her eventually went, meant a, a vegan future. So she campaigned first uh, for the Vegan Society as its general secretary uh, and editor of the, the magazine. Uh, that was from the 1970s and then from 84 onwards was a co-founder of the Movement for Compassionate Living that I mentioned before. And as I said, is still up on, on line. I think, I think the actual base of that is now in Wales, as far as I remember. She, she left the Vegan Society, and there's some controversy about how and why, but she left really because she wanted to concentrate on eco-veganism 
ecological veganism it was called at the time and if you watch the um the film i mentioned at the beginning all the way through you'll see that she's basically saying that's what she wanted to concentrate on but she didn't want to do it within the vegan society she said that she respected their kind of focus um on uh, animal issues as the focus and then other issues as the scope but she wanted to focus on the scope part of it if that makes sense so um so that's how she kind of went from the one organization to the other she was born into a very uh, poor family she remembers for example as a child having to go to bed early on some days because the gas uh, would run out and so it, she was born into poverty her father was a speaker for the socialist party of britain uh, which later became the british labor party and he would give talks on peace and also the dignity of the working class. A grandfather sounds like quite a character. He had unorthodox views and was said to be opposed to Kathleen joining the Girl Guides, which he thought were a bit repressive. They represent the status quo, he thought, apparently. So as a bright child, Kathleen Janaway won an educational scholarship to grammar school which is the way it worked in, in those days. And in grammar school, she learned the value of critical thinking and the idea of questioning everything. However, she gave up an opportunity to go to university. It was offered, but she gave that up in order to financially support her family. She worked as a teacher instead. This was a plight of quite a lot of working class people in those days is the fact that you know education and um, helping their family financially was often something that clashed and so therefore they would often have to sacrifice their education particularly uh, for the women uh, sadly but that was just uh, kind of fairly standard within uh, the, the working class <coughs> i hope i don't lose my voice again she married her lifelong partner jack janaway just before the second world war and like Donald Watson, became a conscientious objector. <clears throat> I don't know why I lose my voice when I'm doing these time tunnels. This is the second time it's happened to me. <clears throat> I shall try to uh, speak a little bit lower, see if that uh, helps. So... Um, both Janaways and Watson had become conscientious objectors. Uh, during the war years, they both turned vegetarian when Kathleen saw slaughterhouse trucks arrive to take those lambs away that uh, was mentioned before. But not yet vegan, she helped organize a protest meeting for the organization that was to become, in later years, Oxfam. And the protest was to demand that dried cow's milk was sent to children of allies in mainland Europe uh, during the war. And then we get the move from vegetarianism to veganism. It was her keen ability to see connections between social justice issues that led them really to veganism. Uh, she taught children with learning difficulties. She was a peace and freedom from hunger campaigner and served for many years on the executive committee of the Gandhi uh, Foundation. So everything was, as it were, coming together uh, for her in terms of uh, social justice. Then in 1964, the Observer newspaper in London published a two-page review of this book, uh, Animal Machines by Ruth Harrison. A two-page review is absolutely extraordinary um, it, for those times and for now. Um, and so I think she mentions that in, in the, the long version of the video from the beginning. Uh, so Harrison's uh, new book at the time was called Animal Sh Machines, The New Factory Farming Industry. This was really kind of new. It deeply shocked the entire nation, this book, the Janaways included. It revealed, for example, that calves are separated from their mothers to be sent to veal units in which they were tethered and uh, not allowed solid food. And so Kathleen Janaway said that Animal Machines, the book, had knocked her for six 
it really did did kind of surprise her. So <clears throat> I do have uh, it here. Um, and I just want to show you a couple of pictures, nothing too graphic. Uh, the, there is a chapter here called The New Factory Farming, a Pictorial Summary. So th this is the first picture, as you can see. Okay, and so this is um, a, a depiction of a calf. Now, so there is what is now, what was then quite rare, but now is the usual thing, you know, a grain silo stood next to a, a I mean, that looks like a broiler unit, could be, could be a pig unit, but pig units, you usually got uh, brick uh, bases. Uh, this this one will be so-called poetry uh, poultry. So there is, there is a couple of um, graphic pictures in this, so I won't show you any more. But the interesting part about it is that for the British audience, that will be the first time they'd ever seen anything like that. And so the shock that Kathleen Genoway expresses uh, went around the nation uh, in that sense. And that's what would have ended up being the prompt for a two-page uh, review um, of the book, which I imagine every author in the world would uh, die for, I suppose. Kathleen says, it was at this point that I realized that these calves were the surplus of the dairy industry and that milk, which nature intended for them, was being fed to us. Now, of course, that's a kind of fairly modern day thing to say, and we still say it. In fact, we've got a quote coming up from Kim Stallwood talking about how the arguments um, back then and the arguments now are essentially the same. Um, I think sociologically, it's something to do with the fact that um, we tend not to uh, identify as animals, and we don't identify as apes, of course, and we don't identify as mammals either. And so, although humans are mammals, and even although we might generally understand what lactation means, it's still surprising for a lot of people to learn that mother cows, also mammals, that must be pregnant to give milk. And so you get the arguments about, oh, well, you can create milk without pregnancy, which is true, even in humans, but certainly not the kind of commercially required um, amount, which is why they go through that cycle of repeated pregnancy, and then they are pregnant and lactating. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very tough life for a dairy cow, and that's why she becomes um, so-called um, spent, as the industry say, in, a, in, a, in some short years, and then obviously sent to the slaughterhouse. So the Genoese decided then they would attempt to live without consuming calf food. She said it, it was the animal issue uh, via her concerns for peace and world hunger that got her into um, all of this. <clears throat> so let me bring this back in. She said, my involvement in the animal movement developed out of these, in, in other words, interest in peace and world hunger, uh, particularly when I began to make connections between the different issues. So these, these interconnections were very strong uh, back in those days, and it also wasn't a problem uh, in the movement as it is now. Later in life, she would become involved in something called uh, Plant a Tree for Peace. It was a movement which was started by some of the vegans associated with the movement for compassionate living. But going back to 1964, Kathleen Janoway, just like most people, they had not heard of the philosophy of veganism. They knew nothing of the existence of the vegan social movement, which was only 20 years old at the time. And so she was, you know, rather lost and, and quite isolated, like many of them were. And as an early vegan pioneer, she had the same fears that people like Donald Watson, Eva Batt, and Leslie Cross had held when they first went vegan. And that really was, um, is it possible or not to survive without any products derived from 
other animals. And we've got to remember again that um, when we say this, it seems odd now that it could be a concern, but everybody told them they, they would die without some products derived from other animals. And that included doctors, as, as I've said before, on different time tunnels. So there was a kind of lot against them um, in that sense. Now, although her account is rather disjointed, uh, Victoria Moran, who's uh, written a book called A Passion, the, the Ultimate Ethic, reports on a research trip that she took in 1981 to study vegans uh, both in Ireland and in Britain. And amongst other vegan pioneers that she spoke to, uh, Moran met Kathleen Janaway, who said that the earliest vegans didn't know if our bones would disintegrate or if we perish in a fortnight. <clears throat> so these are real kind of fears uh, at the time, if you like. Eva Bat, as we've seen already, and she also went vegan in the 1950s, she said that she didn't know how she'd manage. She said, I knew people could live without meat, but without milk, no. I really thought I was going to die. And so some of them kind of internalized that message that they got from their vegetarian friends and from their, their doctors. Animal ag advocate and author Mark Gold suggested that some of the initial health fe uh, fears about veganism had been dispelled by the time Janaway became the Vegan Society's general secretary in the 1970s. So things moved on and things got uh, better, as it were. The vegan social movement pioneers not only had a revolutionary vision of the future, but they were very brave trailblazers so we we owe them a great debt <clears throat> i always said that when they got told that they were going to die they said that we'll risk it for a, a vegan biscuit which is what they did and so they went for it essentially so by the 1970s then virtually all of the vegan society literature was uh, written and typed up and produced by kathleen and jack uh, janaway in a leaflet from 1972, it's clear that Kathleen understood the power of culture and of advertising. Writing, the chief, uh, there is, there is um, a warning really about the language. Um, obviously, people are a product of their time. Um, I, I did get a YouTube comment saying that perhaps it needs to be de chauvinized, the, the language, but um, you know, people are a product of their time, and I think people watching this will appreciate that and so i've left the original uh, language um, intact the chief obstacle to man's survival on this overburdened planet lie in the minds of men most people find difficulty in adjusting to ideas that do not fit in with the habits and thought patterns of generations this is very sociological especially one as with the feeding habits of the west both producers and consumers are subject to the high pressure salesmanship of the meat, dairy, and chemical industries. So there's quite an interesting mix of media sociology and um, appreciation of the power of socialization in, in there. Now, the Janaways were issuing warning about the environmental crisis, which became really key to them. But they started doing that from the early 1970s. Uh, Janaway pointed out, for example, that humanity was engaged in what she called an all-out assault on the living systems of the planet. And showing that she shared a similar radical vision to the pioneers of the movement from the 40s uh, and 50s, this is in terms of their thoughts about um, the centrality of the moral evolution of humanity, she declared that, quote, the age of the new man is dawning, uh, with the vegan being, quote, the prototype of the new man of the new age. Again, a little bit flowery, perhaps, but that was um, a common um, idea that through veganism and through the adoption of the philosophy of veganism, uh, a new type of humanity uh, was possible and um, quite likely. And you'll, you'll see in the clip that's coming up, uh, say something very similar uh, to that. So the Janaway's house became 
vegan headquarters in the 1970s. And I always mention this, it is ironically situated in an English town uh, named Leatherhead, which is a great place to have a vegan headquarters. So Movement for Compassionate Living report this. Their house and garden became a venue attended by many over the years for meetings and garden parties to raise funds for the many concerns they were involved in. Now, Ronnie Lee, who became vegan in 1972, as many people will know, went to one of, one of these, uh, I believe. And um, he said he, he found it quite an interesting uh, affair. Many will remember Kathleen and Jack's garden as the place where they came together each year with vegans from up and down uh, the country. The meetings provided a um, opportunity for fellowship and um, being with kindred spirits, that kind of thing. And it was especially important for the more isolated vegans who could get together and meet people um, who had the same values as, they, as them. And also it was found to be a really good uh, meeting place for vegan children so they could kind of meet and play together and, you know, as it were, not be weird for a while, I suppose. Mark Gold says that the Janaways importance to the development and the evolution of the vegan social movement is absolutely huge. He says that Kathleen was all about linking the compassionate desire to avoid animal products with rational use of world food resources. And Gold states that um, uh, over half acre of garden was soon turned over to a horticultural experiment where she and Jack successfully developed green manure techniques i.e. manure from plant sources only, food-bearing trees, vegetables, and fruit bed. Now, many will know that the Vegan Society was featured on the BBC community-based TV program in 1976. It was called Open Door. And reviewing this, um, Kim Stallwood, who himself went vegan in 1976, says to watch the show today is to be reminded how nearly 40 years on, many of the arguments made for veganism then remain the same today. That more people could be fed directly through plants and through, uh, than through animal pro protein, thus alleviating world hunger. That consuming dairy products involved more rights violations against other animals than eating meat. That vegans lower their risk of contracting heart disease and cancers of the colon that the vegan diet requires vitamin B12 supplementation, although this deficiency also occurs amongst many non-vegans. The latest from the doctors, as I understand it, is that everyone, uh, regardless of their dietary choices, should take a B12 supplement uh, after the age of 50. And that vegans are, according to one of the doctors interviewed, normal, healthy, happy people whom uh, you could, couldn't distinguish from omnivores, except that they are slimmer and perhaps smile more. So <laughs> if that's, um, if you recognize yourself in those words, then uh, all, all the better for it. Kathleen Janaway is featured um, at some length in this 76 program, proudly showing off her green manure techniques. Now the show, and um, Stallwood does um, comment on this too. The show looks very dated nowadays. Um, although Ronnie often says that um, when when you hear it, it seems so kind of stiff. Uh, but it was the way people talked in those days, especially when they were on TV. But it looks so dated that uh, vegan comedian Simon Amstel used sections of the original film in his um, mockumentary in 2017, which was called Carnage. And a lot of people can't tell the bits that he created from the bits that he just used because they were uh, they were so kind of um, close to one another. Not least because in the 1976 film, there is a family, a vegan family featured, and they are Mr. and Mrs. Bland. And so I often think that there goes to show that you know people weren't very media savvy, savvy in those days because I'm sure nowadays if you've got a Mr. and Mrs. Bland in a vegan documentary, you'd say, 
can we just change your name for the duration? Because it, it doesn't look good. So the production values of this program are very uh, low. But it should be remembered that what was going on was the BBC was, was giving their resources to NGOs and social movements um, to showcase their work. So it was essentially kind of the BBC would turn up with all their technicians and their equipment and say, OK, what do, we, what do you want to do? And so they would literally just film what these NGOs wanted. So I'm going to show you a little uh, clip. Uh, from it now I did add some subtitles to it because I think it's probably going to be necessary so let's see if we can get this going Kathleen January secretary of the vegan society uh, Kathleen <coughs> some say that animal manures are necessary for the health of the soil I know people say so but there's no real reason to back their statement no research Hundreds of gardens like my own grow excellent crops with no artificials, no animal manure, nothing except vegetable compost made from vegetable wastes. After all, animal manure is only plants passed through animals. I pass plants through my compost bins instead. All the inedible bits of fruits and vegetables Go in layers in these bins. I cover them. I'm sorry. I cover them with layers of weeds. A thin layer of soil and a sprinkling of herbal activator. And in six or twelve weeks, you get marvellous compost. That grows excellent crops. Last year, we had 200 weight of tomatoes in this garden. Lots of beans. Giant cucumbers. And many other crops. All grown from vegetable compost. Why use artificial fertilizers that can do damage to the soil structure and life and cost irreplaceable fossil fuel to make? Why use animal manure when animals need so much land and work to support them when you can get good crops with just vegetable waste, earthworm, bacteria that live in small bins? And as for doing it on the wider scale of the farm, why should it be more difficult than cutting grass for hay and silage? Anyway, if England turned vegan, we'd need so much less land to produce food. We'd have wide acres for forests and wildlife and recreation. At the moment, 90% of the agricultural land of England goes to support animals. If we are going to feed people, we have just got to stop breeding these pathetic creatures. The Sahara Desert. Yes, and so uh, Jack um, uh, went on to talk about the Sahara Desert. So they were they did all that composting and then immediately started talking about deserts, which was quite interesting. Uh, as I said, um, Andy has also enhanced that um, that documentary. So that's also on his uh, YouTube channel, uh, Not Your Mum, Not Your Milk, with a dot after mum, um, as I said. So Gold claims that some dismiss Kathleen Janaway as a crank. In fact, he's got a chapter. Uh, I think it's called... Uh, Janaway crank or vision, I think. And that was due to her utopian vision of the future, which, to be honest, was shared by most of the uh, vegan pioneers. So let's bring the PowerPoint back. She looked forward with optimism towards a tree-based culture in which animal agriculture would be replaced by forests providing food, a mitigating factor against climate change, which is always called global warming in those days, and preventing soil, uh, soil erosion. She wanted to see a global network of tree-based 
autonomous vegan villages replacing industrialized cities. So Genoa's tree-based vision of the future is indeed truly revolutionary. It would prevent monocropping, it would end unemployment and refertilize areas of desert. There was even talk about whether money would be abolished as part of Movement for Compassionate Living's vision of the future. She was um, she was big on things like bartering and swapping and you know community-based kind of uh, cooperation, I suppose. She was also a great supporter of science, but argued that it had to be guided by compassion. The enormous power of, uh, that humans have needs compassionate direction, she argued. She believed that humanity's moral development had fallen behind and food is part of the reason. This again is echoing very much people like Leslie Cross and, and uh, Eva Batt and uh, Donald Watson. She argues that when parents tell their children that they must eat animal products and are pu punished if they don't, the child must in turn suppress their compassionate side. Interesting social psychology. On the other hand, veganism manifests a properly balanced human being, she believed. In 1986, Janaway wrote, freedom from dependence on the slaughterhouse nurtures faith in the possibility of creating a compassionate age. In terms of active campaigning and advocacy, she said that anger has its place. She also says that in that uh, film that I keep referencing. But it should be an anger that is directed against the act rather than the actor. After all, she argues, you don't change cruel people with more hostility. She said that education is the key to spreading veganism, and this entails us taking the time to educate ourselves. She said that we must be aware that the present materialist, competitive, violent civilization, which has spread rap rapidly through the world, is not sustainable. We need, above all, a vision and hope of a practically based alternative. She also said, time is not on our side. And certainly the daily slaughter of other animals demands urgency in any rate. Once she had moved then to Movement for Compassionate Living, she developed these ideas of a tree-based culture uh, much more fully. Through growing enough trees, she argued, we can satisfy nearly every human need, including that for food, and at the same time, do much to restore and maintain planetary health. Adding, what is needed is a trend towards compassionate living the vegan way. In fact, that's the full title of the, of the group, uh, uh, Movement for Compassionate Living the Vegan Way, with the emphasis on the use of trees and their products. Janaway warned that humans had created a second population explosion of deliberately bred other animals competing with humans for diminishing resources, which adds to uh, the creation of deserts, erosion, pollution, global warming, and ozone layer depletion. In terms of her position on interconnections, Janaway recognized that veganism must be central to our thinking. And again, echoing the views of the pioneers of the 40s and 50s, or the ones a little bit before her, she un underscores their point that veganism represents the liberation of humans and uh, other animals. And she also states that with great hope, uh, she thinks that an uh, era of true abundant living will dawn in which humans at peace with themselves, with each other, and with all living creatures will reach heights of creativity as yet uh, unimagined. Okay, so let me drop uh, this out. Um, so that's your PowerPoint, and that's your time tunnel. It's my PowerPoint, your time tunnel, uh, but I'm going to show you a, a last bit of of a clip uh, which really kind of summarizes everything we've said so far. It's really quite impressive stuff. And um, 
I hope you enjoyed this one. And I'll, I'll see you again next week for another time tunnel with um, a less croaky voice, hopefully. To Doom's watch a little bit, but not for long. Because actually, I grow more and more optimistic. It seems clear to me that the age of predatory man is coming to an end. He is destroying not only the animals, but the whole planet and himself too. He cannot go on. And the alternative is the vegan way, compassion to all life, all the animals, and also to the planet, the plants, and the humans. That's the only alternative. And it is our awesome responsibility to bear the task of in producing that alternative to the whole <coughs> world. I feel that the change will only come when we get the masses of the people changing. It's no good just alone attacking the government. It's no good attacking the industry. The politicians will go on until they're frightened of losing the votes. The industrialists will go on until they won't sell their goods. It's the masses of people that we've got to get to, and we've got to raise their awareness. Global warming <laughs> can be reversed, and people better supplied with food and other necessities if we use land for trees and not animal farming. It's not the reform of animal farming we want. It's the end of it. And in a visual world, as I think you know, there'd be so much less land required to feed people that there could be wide areas for wildlife where animals can live their own natural lives in their own natural ways, free of our interference. Perhaps they would realize that they no longer need to fear us. And we could sometimes have the privilege of making proper relationships with them. But the general picture now, I'm quite sure, is that the age of predatory man is coming to an end. Will a new age, in accordance with the teaching of the great, Follow, or will we go right down, right there, and have to climb up the evolutionary tree again? We've all got a part to play in that, but I think generally it's hope. And if we can solve this problem of animal exploitation and spread veganism, we should also solve the problems of war and poverty. And all the other things that has caused immense suffering to people and animals through the ages. Veganism is as important as that. 